It's hard to pick just one thing that I love about Toronto. I love how diverse the city is. Obviously, the first thing we have to talk about is our food. We have such an incredible diversity of restaurants. You can pretty much get anything here, and it will be done right. It'll be authentic. From lots of great Asian food to Mexican food, Cuban food, French food. Taste the entire globe in a day. Every neighborhood has its own flavor. Multiple Chinatowns. You head to the Danforth, our Greek district. You head up, Midtown. Little Jamaica is still thriving. And then you head back downtown. Pedestrian Sunday and Kensington Market. Kensington Market is just a collection of so many different cultures and stories over time. A lot of my favorite restaurants and vendors are still serving, doing their thing, just begging to be discovered or rediscovered. And there is so much to discover in the city. I love to do it by bike. That is the one thing that saved me this year. There are tons of trails around the Don River, Don Valley, Evergreen Brickworks, Woodvine Beach, Boardwalk. There are so many different well-known and hidden green spaces in the city where you can escape and forget that just a couple blocks away you're right back in the action. So everybody knows about visiting the Toronto Islands in the summer months but most people don't realize that you can also visit in the winter. I'd say pack some snowshoes or cross-country skis if you've got them. You can't beat those amazing skyline views from the Toronto Islands. One thing I have not tried that I want to is stand up paddleboarding out of the Scarborough Bluffs so I'm going to go on the board and take in the bluffs from a different perspective. I feel like I must be the last person in the entire city to try the edge walk. Way at the top of the CN Tower. I need to get up there, take the entire city in. I, w I would never, I would never do the edge walk. You could not pay me. <laughs> what do I miss most? People, gatherings. The city has such an amazing, frenetic and buzzy energy to it. It's lively, it's vibrant, it's people running into each other that they haven't seen in a long time. Or being out and randomly making new friends. Did, you, did someone just say hi? Yep. <laughs> so when the city fully reopens, the first thing I'm doing is taking my son to the aquarium and the Toronto Zoo. I am dying to go to a concert. You know, we just have such world-class talent here, and we also have world-class performers coming to visit us. Events and exhibits, whether it's uh, a festival, it's an art exhibit, it's a light installation. The Toronto Christmas Market, Pride, Carabana, the CNE. This city does festivals like no other, so I can't wait until they return in their full glory. Something that I discovered about Toronto over this past year is that we're tough much tougher than advertised. I've just been blown away by the creativity to make it work. They are putting their work and their love on a plate or on the rack or wherever they put it. Overnight, merchants have had to figure out how to sell their stuff online. Fine dining establishments are creating takeout menus and meal kits. You know, you look at the support of local initiatives that have been going on. So many things that show that people weren't just concerned about themselves, but their neighbors. This support of small business and community is beautiful and I think that's a true testament to the people who call Toronto home. We have made it this far and I'm excited for what's to come. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Toronto Global's International Summit, Stronger Than Ever. I am Mark Kohan, the chair of the board of Toronto Global, and I'd like to welcome you from around the world. I probably should have said good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, because we have participants from 50 countries around the world. When I look at the list, the registration list, it's quite amazing. New Zealand, Hong Kong, France, the UK, the United States, Peru, just to name a few. And today, what we want to do, we want to leave you sharing the excitement and enthusiasm we have for the Toronto region. And to get you thinking about that, 
We've partnered with the International Economic Forum of the Americas to bring together an all-star cast of speakers from around the world, both here live at Billy Bishop Airport in downtown Toronto, and also in many countries around the world. We have speakers from India to the UK to Silicon Valley. The one thing they all share in common is they're here to celebrate Toronto and the Toronto region, to celebrate the reopening of our economy, to fuel new investment in our region, and to share that enduring confidence that we all have in the Toronto region, that this is the best place to live, to work, to visit, and to invest. Now, I say that with pride and with confidence. I say it because I am a Canadian who has lived in four different countries around the world and has probably conducted business in about 35 different nations. And I'm going to be a little bit un-Canadian for the moment right now. I want to boast for a minute. It's not part of our DNA, uh, but I'm going to do that. I call it Canadian swagger. It's confidence but humble, you know, proud but not being cocky. And as we emerge from this global pandemic and we go through our cycles like everyone else, we are looking to build a stronger, more resilient and more inclusive Toronto region uh, for the future. And I'm confident we can do that because we have a great foundation in place. Now, if I could boast for a minute, Toronto really is the business and financial capital of Canada. Uh, we represent 20% of the GDP of our nation. We have the fastest growing tech talent pool in North America, even more than Silicon Valley, growing by over 40% in the last five years. We are the second safest city in the world. That really talks to our quality of life. We are one of the greenest cities in the world. If you just saw the video that we showed before the conference started, it's amazing. You took a helicopter, you would see 80-story buildings and millions and millions of trees and rivers and lakes. It's quite a remarkable place. Now, I'm, I'm also excited about our music talent. We have the greatest artists in the world coming from Toronto. Think of Drake, The Weeknd, Shawn Mendes, Alessia Cara. Justin Bieber, we'll count him too. A little outside of Toronto, but not close to home. And most importantly, we are one of the most diverse cities in the world, with over 51% of our residents being born outside of Canada. And we welcome almost 100,000 immigrants every year to our country. I talk to my daughter all the time, Parker, who's 15 years old, and I say, Parker, you can be a citizen of the world just by going to your classroom and sharing it with kids from around the world. Now, for all of these reasons, this is why, even through the pandemic, this is why companies continue to invest in the Toronto region. We have companies joining us today who have invested here over the last 18 months. Companies like household names like Reddit and H HCL and Infosys and uh, Sanofi and Pinterest. We want to thank them for believing in what we, we believe in about Toronto. Now today we are going to have some stimulating and insightful conversations with global business leaders and government leaders. For those in the audience who are from the Toronto region, I want you to think about this, about these conversations today. I want you to be proud of the place we call home, where we live and work, and be confident in our collective future. And for the global audiences, for those 50 nations around the world that are tuning in today, this really is an open invitation to become here and be a part of this dynamic and growing business and cultural community that we call Toronto. We want to ensure that the Toronto region leads our country's recovery and cements its place as the best place to invest in North America. And as we get ready to kick off this conference, we're thrilled to be hosting it here at our downtown airport, our second airport in the city, Billy Bishop Airport, which recently was ranked as, I think, one of the top 10 in the world in terms of amazing landings. You land over the water and you see the downtown core. It's quite remarkable and beautiful, beautiful. But it's a sign of our recovery and us opening up. We also want to thank our many sponsors who have made this possible today. Ports Toronto, Newport Aviation, the Globe and Mail, and Air, and Air Canada. Thank you to all of them for supporting us today. In a minute, I'm going to turn over the stage to um, some great leaders, people that have shown us through some difficult times for our province, for our country, and for the world. 
They are Ontario Doug Ford, our Premier, uh, and Mayor John Tory. These are two dynamic leaders who share their passion for Toronto and its recovery, and you will see it when you hear from them shortly. I want to thank you for joining us today. It's going to be a great few hours of interesting conversations. And most importantly, I hope over the next year, we can actually host you here in Toronto and you can fall in love with the city that we love so much. It's now my pleasure to turn over to the stage, our CEO of Toronto Global, a man who recently moved back to Toronto and fell in love with it again, Stephen Lund. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Mark. Uh, welcome, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Again, as Mark said, my name is Stephen Lund. I'm the CEO of Toronto Global. We work with organizations across the GTA. We work with the federal government, the provincial government, the municipalities to help drive new business growth to this region. I must say it's great to be back at Billy Bishop Airport. Just to see the excitement and the energy it's great to see us back. It's also great to put a tie on again. It's been quite a while and a proper pair of pants. So welcome everybody. Great. We have a great lineup today of speakers, the Premier, the Mayor. We also have joining us by video, uh, Mayor Crombie, Mayor Brown, and we have some world leading executives from some terrific companies. So again, let's get started. First of all, look, I, these last uh, 18 months have been difficult. I know that. Um, on a lot of businesses and a lot of companies. But one thing I do know is we will get through this. We will come back stronger. We've got terrific leadership here at all levels of government, in our communities, and in our business community. So we're really looking forward to getting back on track. I also want to mention that when we started looking at putting a summit together, it started off uh, a conversation the mayor and I and Mark had a few months ago. We were hoping to get three or 400 people. I can proudly say that we're over 1,500 people representing 50 countries around the world. So thank you so much for joining us for this exciting time. As I mentioned, we've got a great lineup, so let's get started. On video, we have Premier Doug Ford joining us, a dedicated community leader, leader successful businessman, a passionate advocate for the people of our province. His commitment to public service expands over 20 years, and he's been key in driving new investment and creating jobs in our province, and also leading us through these difficult times the last 18 months. So I'll turn it over to Premier Ford, and thank you for joining us. Well, good morning, everyone. It's a real pleasure and privilege to address the Toronto Global Summit. A special thanks to you, Stephen Lund, for your leadership and efforts in bringing this together. The work that Toronto Global does is so important and will be crucial to our success as we continue the fight against COVID-19. And I want to take a moment to recognize the leadership of Newport Aviation for their incredible management of the airport and to reaffirm how important that it is for the City of Toronto and the entire province. And I know Mayor Tory who continues to be an exceptional partner throughout this pandemic, would agree with me on that. As I stand here, we're at a pivotal moment in our battle with this ever-changing virus. We've been in this fight for over 18 months, a once-in-a-generation health crisis that has forced governments around the world to make difficult choices in an effort to protect the health and safety of our people because protecting people's health has always been and always will be our top objective. But the decisions we made came with a significant cost, a cost felt by many, including business owners, who were each asked to sacrifice so much. Throughout this pandemic, as new variants arrived, business owners constantly adapted to a changing environment, one that demanded they pivot their operations but in true Ontario spirit, they responded. They did what was necessary to help protect all Ontarians. For that, we are forever grateful. And we said that we'd always have their backs. That was a promise, and we are working every day to make sure we keep that promise. Whether it was financial support, resources for employers, or helping them evolve digitally, supporting Ontario businesses was at the forefront of this government's efforts. And now, 
having delivered a world-leading vaccine rollout, what businesses of all sizes need is stability and certainty. So as we continue to live with this virus, we're able to find safe ways to move forward, confident in our ability to protect Ontarians. That is why Ontario will require proof of vaccination for certain settings, effective September 22nd. Along with the most cautious reopening in Canada, Ontario's vaccine certificate is another step to ensure we don't need to return to lockdowns and will give our business community the comfort to continue operating. But we must stay cautious. We must always be careful. We can't jeopardize the hard-earned gains we've made. As I said earlier, we're at a pivotal time in our fight against this terrible, terrible virus. The choices we make now will have an immediate and lasting effect for Ontario. We're determined to continue with a cautious approach to managing COVID, one that prioritizes people's health while causing as little disruption as possible to our valued business community. And I can guarantee you this, and you've heard me say it many times before, once we have beaten this pandemic, Ontario will once again be the best destination anywhere in the world to do business because we know that governments don't create jobs. They create the environment and conditions for jobs to be created. And that's what we will continue to do. And I am 100% confident that the economy of this province and this city will take off like never before. And Toronto Global will be leading the charge. So thank you again for all the exceptional work you do. Stay safe and God bless. Thank you so much for joining us, Premier. And again, thank you for your tremendous leadership over these past 18 months. We're gonna have a quick video and then we're going to ask the mayor to join us and say a few words. Take it all in. Show up early, stay late, really late. Live your passion, leave an impression, commit. Get out, get in, embrace the moment. Hold, 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 ah, <laughs> overdo it. Do more, leave less, breathe. Get the bag, keep one packed. Don't put it off. Because when we make it count, we rise higher. I would now like to welcome to the stage Mayor John Tory, a successful lawyer and businessman. But really, what we know Mr. John Tory for is really his leadership over the past 18 months, getting us through these difficult times. But also, if you think about it, since 2014, the tremendous growth of our city. We are one of the most diverse cities in the world, one of the fastest growings, a hotbed for technology, arts, music, you name it. 
And it's all come under his watch. And we really appreciate what he's done for our city and for his leadership. So I'm going to ask the mayor to join us and say a few words. Well, Stephen, thank you. And I want to uh, begin by saying how pleased I am to be here at the Stronger Than Ever Summit. What a great title for uh, a city region that uh, continues to go from strength to strength and has come out of the pandemic or is coming out of the pandemic uh, in a way that I think represents opportunity for all the people that have uh, joined us today. And I'm so glad that you have joined us, people from around the world, uh, to hear a message of welcome, a message of, uh, of uh, determination on our part to be the best home that we could possibly be uh, for people uh, from around the world to invest and create jobs. And I'm a proud uh, spokesperson and promoter of the entire region. Uh, I'm one of those who believes that this is good for Canada to have a region, the strength uh, of uh, southern Ontario and of the greater Toronto area. Uh, I'm also one who believes that the city that I have the privilege to lead, the city of Toronto, will be a beneficiary regardless of where in the region people choose to invest and to create jobs. And so uh, I'm out there uh, with my colleagues, some of whom you'll hear from today, uh, promoting the region, but also, of course, promoting the city that, uh, that I lead, the city of Toronto. And so. Um, it, it is one of those things where uh, it is, it is uh, not as good as having 400 people in a room, as Stephen said, but we're just delighted and it's more convenient for you not having to uh, travel as far as to come here, but we do hope that we can welcome you uh, going forward uh, in person. I am very proud to say that the Toronto region and the City of Toronto itself are, are global success stories, and I'm proud of that. Uh, it is something we've worked hard to achieve. People before me have worked very hard to create the foundations for success that are in place in Toronto today. And I believe that the foundations that have been put in place, including in particular uh, our welcoming of people from around the world to build up our population, 51% of whom, as was mentioned, are people who were born outside of the country. But this has been a blessing uh, for us. We've, we've got the most diverse city region in the world here, uh, and we're taking full advantage of all the smart people that have come our way from around the world and all that they've brought with them. Uh, we are working hard at City Hall to produce a strong recovery uh, for the City of Toronto and, and uh, with our partners in the region. Uh, the work that the Premier outlined that the province is doing, same thing. And we, uh, I completely endorse what he said about the need for us to be cautious in doing that, but we're being cautious and determined at one and the same time uh, to make sure that we can serve well those businesses who are already here, which we try very hard to do, but also to attract new businesses and new jobs uh, to this city region. That uh, will be made easier by the fact we have worked hard over the last number of months and we've worked in partnership with one another. I've had an excellent working relationship uh, before the pandemic but also very importantly during the pandemic with Prime Minister Trudeau and with Premier Ford and their governments uh, and we have done everything we can to help people and businesses get through uh, what has been a most difficult time. We have made sure that uh, businesses, uh, while we looked after vulnerable people first and foremost, that businesses were not uh, left behind in that regard. And I think that it's helped a lot of them to have the support of their governments, plural, uh, in uh, getting through this very difficult period. The fight uh, against the pandemic and against COVID-19 is not over, but you know we are much closer to the end uh, than we are to the beginning. And I think that is the same experience that I hope most of you are experiencing in different parts of the world. In our case, a lot of that is thanks to the residents who live in this region. I can speak in the case of the City of Toronto uh, to the fact that 78% of our population of millions have been fully vaccinated now. Uh, 83% uh, have had their first dose, and, and uh, there's, so there's a few that are on their way to the second dose, but that is a number that is respectable in any quarter of the world, and that is thanks to the efforts we've all made together, but including the people that have stepped forward as individuals to get vaccinated. This uh, has allowed us to begin the task of reopening and recovering and renewing, uh, and that is important to our entire country because this region, as was mentioned by Mark, uh, rep represents 20% of the entire national economy, one of the biggest economies in the world. And I want to say that Toronto Global has carried on with its work, and I'm so proud of, uh, of I've been involved with Toronto Global since its inception, and uh, under the leadership of Stephen as CEO and Mark as chair, uh, they're doing a great job to even put on something like this to remind people of the fact that we're here, uh, we're welcoming, we're embracing, we're supporting, um, and that uh, we've carried on doing that throughout uh, the entire uh, pandemic. And today we find in the city region, uh, uh, of which Toronto is at the heart, that the restaurants are open. Our baseball team, the Toronto Blue Jays, are back. There are fans in the stands watching them. Our city halls uh, are open uh, to serve the public. 
uh, students at all levels. I was just out celebrating the first day of school in the city of Toronto today for most of the primary and secondary uh, students. They're back. The university and college students are back uh, to in-class learning and I think that was important as well for their well-being but also for the effectiveness of what is a very excellent uh, public education system. And just right here yesterday at this incredible downtown airport where you do are as close as it looks. If you could look behind me and see uh, the buildings of the financial district, uh, they're right there. Uh, and you land uh, within minutes of those buildings at this airport. And uh, this airport opened itself up again for commercial business just yesterday. So this is all great progress, which is laying the groundwork for a great recovery. And that strong recovery includes you. We want it to include you, not just in the recovery, but well beyond what I know will be a strong and lasting recovery. And so we created this summit to tell you about Toronto's success, the success of this region, and our commitment to a robust economic recovery and a robust economic growth and investment going forward. We are incredibly focused on encouraging and securing more jobs, more business, and more tourism here in the entire Greater Toronto Area. I'm determined as mayor to support this restart and continue my job, which I undertook long before the pandemic began, promoting this region as a great place to invest, a great place to live, a great place uh, to do business. Even during the pandemic, global corporations like Netflix, like Reddit, like Twitter, like Infosys said yes uh, to investing uh, in the Toronto region and many Toronto-based companies like Wattpad and Wealthsimple and The Score recommitted themselves to making bigger investments here, staying here, creating more jobs here. And so it must mean beyond looking after and supporting and, and uh, you know, I'll call it selling people on being here that we're doing something right that those people will all, would all want to be here. We know that the Greater Toronto Tech System, for example, experienced its best quarter ever in the first quarter of 21, 2021 of all times to have the best quarter ever in terms of money raising, a billion point one five, one point one five billion dollars was raised to support that tech ecosystem during that quarter of 2021 as we just began to emerge from a, a, a terrible pandemic. The largest quarter ever in terms of investment dollars and the number of deals that those represented. Here are key facts that I want you to take away uh, from today. And as Mark said, uh, we're not big on sort of boasting and bragging, but we just want you to know some of the facts that are important for you as business people when you make decisions. You want to rely on facts. You want to, want to rely on our attitude, uh, but you want to rely more than anything else on facts. First, you've heard it before, but once again, the Toronto region is one of the fastest growing and largest metropolitan regions in all of North America. Toronto itself, the city of Toronto itself, is the fourth biggest city in North America. By 2041, the region is projected to grow to nearly 10 million people from 7 million today. So even today, it is a very big metropolitan region in North America in terms. Secondly, from 2013 to 2019, 80,000 tech jobs were created in the Toronto-Waterloo corridor alone, more than in San Francisco, Seattle, and Washington, D.C. combined. And we're committed to continuing that job growth in the wake of the pandemic. In fact, it has continued alongside that incredible investment that I made reference to a moment ago. The tech ecosystem is driven by a talent pool that is as big as it is diverse, and that pool is continuously being fed by 18 excellent colleges and universities in this region alone, and by a very welcoming approach to immigration. There's not much debate about immigration here. In fact, there's virtually none, because we know what a blessing it has been for our country. We know it has built the population that is 51% born in other countries, and what a blessing those people have brought to our economy and to our city and to our way of life. Thirdly. We are Canada's economic engine. As I said earlier, the Toronto region's economy represents 20% of Canada's entire GDP. Fully one-fifth of one of the world's largest economies is centered right here. Fourth, the Toronto region's prime location provides businesses with excellent North American and international market access, including a market of 130 million people within a 500-mile radius. And that includes fantastic transportation, including this very airport downtown in the heart of Toronto. Fifthly, as the business and financial capital of Canada, the Toronto region is home to 40% of Canada's business headquarters across every sector you could name. We are, in our own right, a respected global financial capital and, and, and a respected capital for many other industries. Sixth, Toronto ranks as the urban centre with the most cranes in all of North America. And that really, I guess, is meant to tell you that there is confidence in the city going forward. 208 construction cranes working on various large-scale developments right at this moment in time, representing almost one-third of all of the construction cranes in cities across North America. That's confidence. 
that's jobs, that's economic activity, that's ourselves preparing for people to come and invest here and to live here in the City of Toronto. Our economy was extremely strong before the pandemic and that success will continue because we have everything here in the Toronto region to fuel that success. The talent pool, the talent pipeline, I mentioned those colleges and universities and the work we do with our, our union partners to train and apprentice uh, people. The quality of life, these continue to make the Toronto region a magnet uh, for investment and smart people. Most importantly, we are a place that everyone can call home. Toronto is the most diverse major city in the world. That was uh, backed up by the BBC. They one time said that they thought it was London. The BBC did their own fact-checking, not at our urging, and came back and said, no, in fact, Toronto was the most diverse city in the world. 51% of our residents born outside the country, 170 languages and dialects spoken here. But it's more than just what languages are spoken or how many nationalities are represented. We embrace people from all over the world. We gain from them. We learn from them. We celebrate the fact that we're different in some respects in our background, and we make that work for not just the benefit of ourselves as people, but for the businesses uh, that are here. We're proud of that diversity and we're committed to embracing every single person without exception who lives in our city region. More than 100,000 immigrants find their way to the Toronto region as their new home. They choose to come here every single year, 100,000 people every year. So I hope that I have conveyed to you why the Toronto region is the right place to invest and the right place to grow your business. I am very optimistic. I've been saying this since the darkest days of the pandemic. Why have I been optimistic throughout that time? And to add to the Premier's words, he used the words stability and certainty, and those are very important to me as the Mayor as well, but I would also add optimism and hope and vigilance. Vigilance against the pandemic and vigilance against things that would disrupt uh, this way of life, this, this calm uh, way in which we want to welcome businesses and innovation here. But I have remained optimistic because all of the fundamentals that led to the growth of the city region are still here. The talent is still here. The industrial uh, concentrations in various industries are still here. Uh, the, in, the talent pipeline is still here, providing excellent graduates from our colleges and universities. And Toronto Global is still here. Uh, to make sure that we can do everything we can to have you understand what a great place this is to invest and do business and to support you uh, once you get here. We know that the best way that we can help our residents recover from the pandemic, the best way we can help Canada to recover from this pandemic is to make sure that we are strong economically. And that means that we have to help our businesses, help them to come here, help them when they get here to have a stable, solid footing, help them to grow, because that will create the wealth that will in turn make sure that we can support our population with the excellent programs, including healthcare and education, that we pride ourselves on. We want you to help us to be stronger in this country and to help be stronger uh, in, in this city region. And that can come from your making the choice uh, to come here, to expand here, uh, to join many people who have already chosen to make Toronto their home. And we are trying to keep that success story going, which I'm sure we'll be able to do, so that we can stand here and give meaning to those words uh, that are behind me and that are really uh, overseeing this entire, uh, this entire gathering today stronger than ever. So thank you very much for your attention, and I will look forward to welcoming you in person as you come uh, to visit us as circumstances permit. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mayor. Uh, look, at we at Toronto Global share your excitement, uh, your passion, and your enthusiasm. We're really excited about the future. Um, as Mark mentioned, I moved back to this city a year ago in the middle of a pandemic, and I've thoroughly enjoyed working with my team, working with the mayor, premier, the other mayors, uh, all of our partners. We think this is gonna, region's gonna take off again and be stronger than ever, and we're really excited to be part of it. Uh, I also wanted to mention that uh, Look, the mayor is uh, such a strong believer in this region, and not just the city of Toronto, but the entire region. He's a big promoter for everything that works well in this region. He's also an amazing person to have in a client meeting. Um, we bring him in as our closer. Uh, we've seen a lot of companies come here, and a lot of it's due to his enthusiasm, uh, his commitment to the city, uh, and his optimism. We're gonna see if we have a couple of questions now. Let me start off, Mayor, and ask uh, you a question. Uh, what has been your biggest challenge through these last 18 months and what's been the city's biggest challenge and how have you overcome these? Well, I think the, the biggest challenge has been uh, providing support and we had you know, many different categories of people, but I'll mention two that were crucial for us to support and there are two in a way that are at opposite ends of the spectrum. 
um, we had to continue to support business. I mean, had we not had the programs, and I give full marks to the other governments for helping to lead the charge on financing programs that provided supports to business, rent relief, uh, wage subsidies, and so on, a lot of those businesses just wouldn't have made it through what has been a much longer period of time in the recession than we, uh, than the, um, during the pandemic than we had thought. Um, and so I think that was a big challenge and to make sure we got things right. And we had other kinds of programs beyond just support that said, okay, let's digitize businesses. We, we had a program called Digital Main Street that the City of Toronto uh, initiated and it went nationwide eventually that, that brought thousands, literally thousands of businesses online during the pandemic, but they had no online presence before, couldn't sell to anybody because they were closed. Uh, the second challenge was protecting vulnerable people. And this is part of the Canadian values, it's part of the Canadian way of life that says that it was our first obligation as a city, region, as a city, to support our most vulnerable residents, those who were elderly, those who were infirm in some way, those who were poor. Uh, and they suffered disproportionately from the pandemic. And I think we did a, a world-leading job in, in, look, in looking after them and finding new ways to do that. And then finally, the challenge of vaccination. I mean, this is the biggest vaccination campaign. I'm sure it's true in all the cities that you live in, but this was the biggest vaccination campaign ever conducted in the history of the city. And while we're not done yet, uh, we have vaccinated millions of people to get to that 77% level, um, and that is something that has been done in a very short period of time, thanks to the blessing of the vaccines, and it, we're going to get the rest of the way there to 90% or even higher if we can, in order to make sure people can stay safe and healthy. So those were the biggest challenges, I think, Stephen, and there were many more, but those were three of the big ones. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mayor. Uh, Mayor, Toronto's a great city. It's known for so many things, culture, food, entertainment, sports. What do you look forward to most uh, that you've missed in the last 18 months? I think it's the, it's the arts and culture and just being able to be with other people. You know, the arts and culture are very special here in Toronto. They are part of the soul of the city. You heard Mark talk about music. He could just as easily have talked about film, uh, about uh, dance, about a whole host of things, visual, the visual arts. Um, but it's very important to the city's soul and to bringing people together. If you think about being the most diverse city in the world, um, you know, that means that there are people who can't necessarily communicate with each other in the same language, especially newcomers, but they can all go to a music concert and appreciate uh, a concert. And so I think music and the arts, because they bring people together, but also because they uh, will uplift us, and they have during the uh, pandemic. And so I look forward most to being able to just go with other people. Our great and renowned Toronto International Film Festival opens tonight. Uh, and it's going to be a scaled back version with fewer in-person screenings just because of the continuing uh, need for public health measures. But I think it just marks a turning point, as did the reopening of this airport yesterday, where people can come together, can travel, can enjoy a film together, even on restricted, uh, under restricted conditions. Uh, and I think that's something that, uh, for me, is going to be most welcome, the, just even the opportunity to go see a movie, which we haven't done, and to see uh, friends and family together. So I think that's going to be one of many things that will get better and better as the days go forward. And as as we uh, emerge stronger than ever. Great, Mayor, thank you so much. We're gonna turn it over now to Taylor Jancy from Global Public Affairs and see if we have any questions from the media or our audience. Taylor. Thank you. Thank you, we have some questions from our delegates. So the first question is, Toronto real estate is heating up on both commercial and the residential side which has an impact on businesses wanting to open up shop and grow here. What is your plan to control that bubble and make real estate transactions more accessible? Well, first I should tell you that, uh, thank you for the question, I should first tell you that uh, everybody who looks at the Toronto real estate uh, situation uh, says that while the increase in values, which has a good news part to it as well, but the increase in values has been driven by fundamentals and not by artificial kinds of circumstances. Um, there are lots of people who want to come here. There are lots of people who want to invest here. And the law of supply and demand, which you all understand very well, um, has caused uh, prices to rise. I should point out that um, by many measures in terms of global cities, uh, we are still a city that can present uh, a, good, uh, a good bargain for you, uh, both residentially and uh, commercially. And I would say that what is going to help us is that very same law of supply and demand. I am pleased at the fact that there continue to be people coming to my office on a regular basis who want to build office buildings and commercial buildings here. And there continue to be the 208 cranes are evidence of something. That's evidence of people who have made the decision to try to keep up with that growth that is going on here by building more residences and more uh, office buildings and other kinds of business uh, premises uh, for people to have. And so I would just say that uh, we are going to try to contribute to that by making sure that we approve uh, those projects carefully, but at the same time on as expeditious a basis as we can. 
I've worked very hard to keep the finances of the city in good order. We recently just had our credit rating reaffirmed with a commentary from uh, the rating agency Moody's that said that the city was well managed financially with uh, debt uh, ratios that were healthy and, and consistent. Um, and I'm trying to keep taxes uh, down, uh, as I've committed to do throughout the time that I've been mayor. And so those are all things that we're going to do, but I think that can create the kind of environment the Premier talked about where people want to build here. They want to build here, and it's going to be the law of supply and demand, including a big push on affordable housing, which we're making together with the other governments, uh, that is going to uh, answer the question of how do we make sure that there can be room in the city for people from all walks of life uh, and all the different levels and, and groups of employees that will work for people who choose to invest here. So I'm confident we can be up to that job, as well as building the transit that needed to get them around, which we're doing in an unprecedented scale at this moment in time. Thank you. We have uh, one more question. You spoke about the growth of tech business and roles prior to 2019 and that the goal is for this to continue. What would you say are the other top industry verticals that you feel are ready to explode in Toronto in the next two years? Well, we rely for continued strength uh, on uh, sectors like uh, fi finance, uh, the financial services sector, health sciences, uh, like food processing. I mean, we are, again, globally uh, highly respected, highly uh, competent uh, and, and big uh, participant in food processing. And so we'll continue to work at those uh, as well as to, uh, to grow the tech sector. Even something like film, you may say, well, you know, where does film fit in? Film fits into the extent of 35,000 jobs and two billion dollars plus of production annually in this city and so you know that is something where wh why is it doing so well here because our costs are reasonable and because we have an incredibly diverse talent pool and i'm confident with the kinds of pools of expertise and things like ai and machine learning um, food processing where we have the expertise that's been brought from all over the world and they say now sometimes we produce food that is enjoyed in other countries better than they do it at home and we not only consume that here and all do it together and learn about each other in the process but we also export now uh, food uh, to countries and I could go on with with all those things huge investments recently in the sort of pharmaceutical uh, health sciences area so um, these are all areas where we're going to continue to work at having a talent pipeline that's full of smart people at the end of the day there's lots of reasons I mentioned, location, critical mass of other industries, and so on. But the, I think the fundamental driver that is here, that will continue to be here, that will start coming here again from other countries and that we're producing domestically is smart, talented people who want to work. They are diverse people in their backgrounds, which brings a whole different element to people who locate here uh, and proximity to uh, the biggest market in the world. The United States is our best friend. It's our closest neighbor, and it continues to be the biggest market in the world. And we will take every opportunity we can as a city region to exploit uh, that proximity and to make sure that we give you access from here so you can be here in Canada and all that has to offer, but have access to that incredible uh, market uh, throughout North America, including Mexico, as well as part of the free trade uh, zone. So uh, those are the things that will continue to boost because they are the source of our strength now. Okay, Mayor, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. And also, once again, thank you for your tremendous leadership. We do really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Please stay tuned for a short video.
Hi, welcome back. Uh, we're so pleased to have that addressed by the Mayor and the Premier. Welcome Doug Porter, Chief Economist and Managing Director at BMO Financial Group. Doug has over 25 years of experience analyzing global economies and financial markets. As Chief Economist at BMO Financial Group, he oversees the macroeconomic and financial market forecast. Doug, great to see you. Thanks for joining us. I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Thank you for having me, and good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to join you here today to discuss the economic outlook. I understand I have about uh, five minutes uh, to cover the landscape, and given the tumultuous events of the past 18 months, I'm just going to dive uh, right in. I think the, uh, the big picture is that the economy has proved to be resilient to the massive challenges that it's faced in the in the pandemic and it is recovering faster and stronger than most analysts had expected uh, that it would recover say if we went back a year ago or so but no question it still faces very serious challenges and it still has a long way to go uh, before we're fully recovered um, just from a very big picture standpoint uh, for canada we expect the economy uh, to rebound roughly five percent this year which would be one of the strongest growth rates that we've seen in decades and expand by more than 4% next year as tourism more fully recovers. Uh, now, this follows the big 5.3% setback that we saw last year. Um, Ontario and specifically Toronto are following similar contours as the national economy, although Toronto was initially affected a bit more heavily uh, during the downturn. Um, mostly because of the hard hit to tourism. But we believe it will ultimately see an even more forceful rebound, driven by a stronger long-term growth potential than uh, either provincially or, or nationally. Um, clearly, there are some sectors that were greatly affected by the pandemic and will take longer to recover. Tourism, entertainment, dining, gyms, just to mention a few. But then there are others that have stepped up and have actually seen activity well above normal, uh, helping partly offset the damage elsewhere. Housing and durable goods are clear examples of, of that. Looking ahead, the two biggest headwinds facing growth now are the, the spread of Delta, the Delta variant, and the ensuing fourth wave, which again is, is cooling activity in, in some sectors. And second, the relentless supply chain issues and bottlenecks that we're seeing right around the world, which are denting the recovery in many sectors, but most notably in the auto industry and electronics. Um, in turn, these bottlenecks are adding to bubbling inflation pressures. In recent months, Canadian headline inflation has reached its highest level in almost 20 years, at close to 4%, and is likely to average, we think, 3% both this year and next. And just to put that in some kind of historical context, inflation has averaged a little bit less than 2% over the last 10 years. So 3% on average is quite a step up. Now, some of this run-up is clearly temporary. We're reflecting rebound from extreme lows on a number of items a year ago, some due to reopening pressure and some the uh, supply shortages that, as I said, we're seeing in many sectors. We suspect that the latter could persist longer than many expect. And that's why we see inflation still hovering around 3%, even when we get out into, uh, into next year. Now, one of the issues is whether inflation lingers for even longer or sparks even higher. And that may well depend on whether age, wages pick up in earnest. And that is a real possibility, especially given the widespread evidence of a mismatch between job openings, which are plentiful, and still high unemployment, which is hovering around 7.5%. We do see that this jobs mismatch easing over the, the next year, but we'll probably need a clearer signal on the health front before that mismatch entirely goes away. There are three other subjects that I'd like to touch on very quickly that I think are very important to the outlook. First of all, on interest rates. Now, we just heard from the, the Bank of Canada yesterday, and our main conclusion is that interest rates are really going nowhere anytime soon. Uh, in all likelihood, we don't see the Bank of Canada raising interest rates in it for more than a year. Our official call is for the first interest rate increase uh, to be unfolded in October of, uh, of 2022. And that's despite the fact that we are dealing with above average inflation, uh, but on the Flip side, we're still dealing with relatively, uh, you know, a long way to go in in the recovery and some modest disappointment on the growth front in uh, in recent months. A second topic I want to touch on very briefly is housing. Housing has clearly been one of the economic stories of, of the pandemic. Uh, it has been a remarkable performer, uh, perhaps a little bit too remarkable, with uh, things surprising consistently to the high side on that front for both sales and, uh, and prices. Uh, if anything, the GTA has actually been about an average performer in terms of uh, sales growth and price gains over the past year. Um, now, all political parties are 
talking about different ways to try to dampen the market or to, to support uh, first-time buyers. But realistically, we think it will actually take an increase in, in interest rates to ultimately bring this market to heel. And overall, we remain essentially constructive on the housing market. In other words, we still think that it will remain relatively on the strong side unless and until uh, short-term interest rates actually do begin to rise. Uh, the third item I just want to touch on briefly before I hand it back to Stephen is on the uh, the Canadian dollar. The Canadian dollar has had huge swings during the pandemic. At the depths of the pandemic, it actually dropped below 70 cents at one point, made a full recovery back to above 80 cents. It's since weakened in uh, a little bit in, in recent weeks just on some of the concerns over the, uh, the global growth outlook, uh, the spread of the Delta variant, but it's still hovering close to what we consider to be fair value at around 79 cents. Our underlying view is that while the outlook for the Canadian dollar is a little bit more mixed now, on balance we remain relatively positive on the currency simply because a firmer global economy, a firmer Canadian economy, a further, a stronger uh, uh, economy for the GTA is generally a positive thing for the uh, the Canadian dollar. So at least over the uh, the next 12 to 18 months, uh, we believe the Canadian dollar is a little bit more likely to strengthen rather than weaken. The final thing I'll talk about just in terms of the Canadian dollar is one of the reasons we think the Canadian dollar has softened a little bit in recent weeks is we do think there's a bit of an election uncertainty discount attached to the Canadian dollar right, uh, right now. Now, I'm not here to talk about the, uh, the political backdrop, uh, but we do believe that by September 20th or a little bit shortly thereafter, we think the, uh, the clouds will clear in terms of that discount on the Canadian dollar. Um, and current polls do uh, point to a, a status quo result, which we think the financial markets uh, will, will basically accept and, and move on. So on balance, as I said, we see the Canadian dollar somewhat strengthening over the next year. Uh, just summarizing overall, we still do remain relatively positive on the uh, both the Canadian and the Toronto economy over the next 18 months. As I said, we do think the recovery still has some ways to go, but we do remain upbeat and we think that we will be back to something close to normal uh, by the middle part of 22, uh, 2022 for, uh, for the regional economy. Uh, that's it in a nutshell, Stephen. I'll now hand, the, uh, hand it back to you. Thank you very much. So much thanks so much, Doug. Uh, I don't know if I caught an election prediction in there or not, but I'm trying to listen carefully. Doug, you answered a lot of my questions, but let me start with one that you kind of touched on, housing. We, we heard the mayor talk about housing, the, the uh, price, price uh, increase in the Toronto region and across the country. Correspondingly, what we see is an increase in, in uh, mortgage debt. Is that an issue or are we okay now for the next number of years with interest rates where they are? Or is, is that a concern or not to the economy? So if we think back to the good old days of about a year and a half ago before the pandemic, you know, the number one concern for the Canadian and the regional economy was the buildup of, of household debt. That hasn't completely gone away by any means. But, you know, you know, there's been a lot of surprising developments in the last 18 months. But I have to say one of the biggest surprises is that household finance has actually strengthened during the pandemic. They didn't weaken. And a lar largely that was due to the tremendous amount of support uh, offered by, uh, by government policy. But also the decline in interest rates did help uh, soften the, uh, the, the debt burden on, on households. Now, one concerning aspect, though, is that we have started to see household finances begin to deteriorate again alongside... Uh, of course, the uh, the rollicking housing market. You know, the flip side of that has been a, a rebuild in uh, in mortgage debt. I still think households are in better shape now than they were, say, you know, 18 or 24 months ago. But definitely, it's still it you know it still is a key vulnerability for uh, for the Canadian economy over over the medium term. Um, the outlook is for interest rates remain very low for a long period of time. So we do have some uh, runway here for for a period of time. But I, I do regard it as as one of the more serious challenges for uh, for the medium term outlook for the Canadian economy. Okay, thanks, Doug. Uh, Doug, the the U.S. papers this week talked about. Um, you know, a, a bit of a pause and a slowdown in the U.S. economy. They projected 235,000, sorry, they, they projected 720,000 new jobs this past uh, month. They ended up at 235,000. Is it a pause? What does that mean? We've got an audience here representing over 50 countries. Uh, all of us curious what's happening in the U.S. Is that an area of concern for Canada? <laughs> We, we have clearly seen a bit of a moderation in the, in the U.S. Uh, growth rate in, in recent months. And, and by the way, I'd always be cautious about reading too, too much into, into one month's jobs number. We actually had a bit of a sour reading back in, in April as well, and it quickly gave way to uh, very strong numbers in, in the, next, uh, the next few months. So, you know, these things are, are ebbing and flowing. You know, it's definitely not a straight line for, uh, for the recovery on, you know, really in, in any country, but certainly in, uh, in North America. 
So I wouldn't I wouldn't hang my hat too heavily on on one month, uh, but it is it is true that we are starting to see forecasts being whittled down a little bit. Some of that is due to the spread of the Delta variant. Some of it is due to the supply challenges, the supply chain issues I, I talked about. You know, I think an underplayed element uh, in recent months has just been how hard the auto industry has been hit, both in terms of sales and and production. Now, to me, a lot of that is just pent up demand. That's just deferred activity that's going to come roaring back when the supply chain issues do eventually re relax. Um, but to answer your question directly, yeah, the, some of the most optimistic views on the U.S. economy have, you know, we've seen the enthusiasm curbed a bit on the U.S. growth outlook, but we're still looking at almost 6% growth in the U.S. economy this year and close to 4% growth next year. So while it's an uneven path, we still see the U.S. economy uh, recovering nicely over the, over the next 18 months. Okay. Doug, so, thanks so much for joining us. We really appreciate your insight today. And again, thanks. Appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Take care. Now turning our attention, Jeff, the key guy at the airport here, CEO of the airport. Jeff, tell us, what's it like? You're back <laughs> in the saddle. Jeff Wilson is driving things here, ladies and gentlemen. Congratulations on yesterday getting back on track. Well, what's it feel cool. like? Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me here. I, I, I can only say that we're back. Uh, and we're stronger than ever. Uh, we, we really are excited to be here. Look, we, we, we had our commercial services shut down in March of 2020. We didn't know how long this was going to last for. Port Toronto is, a, is an organization that is extremely proud of this facility, Billy Bishop Toronto City Airport. We're the owners and operators, as you know, of Billy Bishop Toronto City Airport. Uh, we're award winning. Uh, our expectation was to continue doing what we've always done, which is to be excellent in service. And and be one of the most popular airports, not just in Canada, but right across the globe. And there are a lot of city airports in the world, and as you heard Mayor Tory say, this is one of the true advantages, I think, to the global economic recovery mm -hmm. and to Toronto's economic recovery. But uh, look, I can, I can answer your question in just one word, really, which is uh, delighted, uh, delighted. Uh, 18 months is a long time to shoulder a business burden and not have the opportunity yeah. to provide what you're built to do. Um, you were, we were talking earlier, Stephen, and you were, you were asking me sort of like, what happens from here? And, you know, we're day two today, day two. Yesterday, as the mayor said, we, uh, we had the privilege of reopening commercial services. Today, uh, our second day, we're growing. And so I guess the way to answer a question like that, what comes next is recovery. First and foremost, our role of recovery within the Toronto economy, and our role in that is to bring passengers to Toronto and allow passengers to travel back and forth. I think friends and family are going to lead that. That's what we're seeing today. Air Canada and Porter are flying new flights, so we're just delighted about that. But we're also focused on some other things that we spoke about earlier, too, which I'll just mention. The environment. Cleaner, greener, quieter is our, is our mandate. We, we can't be a city airport without being cleaner, greener, quieter and adopting the technologies that allow us social license to continue to grow as Toronto grows. Um, importantly, safety. People want to know that when they come to this airport and when they go through the terminal and when they get onto a plane, that there are going to be approachable, understandable directions of safety so everybody can travel well. Um, not least, service. People are used to a certain level of service at this airport walkable, bikeable, Mayor Tory just, just sort of said to the, the, the business center is just over my shoulder here. What well, is? You can walk. You can walk to your appointment in mm. downtown. So there's one great reason to come and use Billy Bishop Airport, of course, as a business person is it's pure convenience factor uh, of getting there, right? So, so these are things that, you know, we have front and center of us is to just do more of what mm. we were doing before and is to get to this recovery as quickly as we can. Mm. Jeff, it's, it's, it's so fantastic to have this airport here for, for all of us, really. And you've done a great job here. Congratulations. It's, it's wonderful to get back on track. Let me ask you a question about the future of travel. Uh, how is it going to change in your mind? Passenger travel, airports, airlines, what's it going to look like, do you think? Well, pe people want to travel. Pe people want to experience the world. People want to experience other people. We've all lived through Zoom calls for many, many, many months. We now know the difference between sitting together. Mm. This is my second day in sitting with a group of people more than my family. <laughs> this, this is an absolutely extraordinary feeling for me. I'm very good for your family too, probably, is it? Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so travel is going to continue to grow. Travel will recover. It will start with friends and family. Business will, will follow. Uh, it is already. So the future of aviation is very much what we just came from, but more importantly, I mentioned cleaner, greener, quieter, mm. which is really the mantra for, for Port 
to Toronto when we think about our assets. And when we, we think about Billy Bishop Airport, we think about making this environmentally quieter, making it less dirty in terms of noxious emissions from fuels that are being burned. We're converting our ferry that you take to get across 404 feet uh, to get to Billy it's Bishop. It's a long ride. Yeah. We're, we're converting that ferry to all lithium ion uh, electric, and, and it's going to be the first in Canada and, and one of only a handful in the world like Great. this. So it is about the environment. It is about uh, the ongoing considerations of high levels of service. But absolutely, it is about facilitating people to get to where they want to go in a way that they really, truly want to. Great. Jeff, thanks for joining us. Congratulations. Uh, all the best. Looking forward to it. Uh, quick break, quick video. Uh, stay tuned, and uh, we get some exciting stuff coming up. Welcome back. At this time, I'd like to introduce our next session. We're kicking off the rest of the day, featuring an all-star lineup of global business leaders, with two of the leading, world's leading investors, entrepreneurs, and economists. You'll hear from Asfani Beshlash and Patrick Pichette on the state of the US, Canadian, and global economies. And even through a pandemic, things are hopping here in Canada. With that, let me turn it over to our chair, Mark Cohan, to lead this session. Mark. Great, thank you, Stephen. It's great to be back uh, here. Um, you know, you heard from the mayor, and the mayor said that this is the fastest growing urban metropolitan region in North America and the fastest growing tech hub. What we want to do is to ensure that that growth continues. And I'm excited about the conversation today. You know, when I'm about to read the bios of Eshani and, and Patrick, I hear my father in the back of my head say, Mark, you are an underachiever. It's unbelievable. Um, let me first uh, introduce Asani Beshloff. She is the founder and CEO of Rock Creek, a leading global investment and advisory firm. She was treasurer and chief investment officer of the World Bank, um, had senior roles at JP Morgan and a partner at Carlyle Group. Um, she has advised governments, central banks, and regulatory agencies around the world on financial and global policies. She was recognized as one of America's most powerful women in banking and has been named one of the most influential women in U.S. finance. Welcome, excited to have you on. Now, not to be outdone, because I see Patrick on this side. Patrick is um, another unbelievable character. Patrick Pichette has over 30 years of financial on operating expertise, leading world-class companies like Google, McKinsey, and her own uh, company here in Canada, Bell Canada. As the CFO of Google from 2018 to 2015, he played an active role in Google's growth uh, across the world and actually helped create the structure for Alphabet, which we know today. Patrick is a partner in Inovia. He's the chair of the board of Twitter. He was recently appointed to the board, I think yesterday, to the board of Wellsimple, one of the leading fintech companies in Canada, which is headquartered right here in Toronto. He is a Rhodes Scholar and a recipient of the National Order of Quebec. Welcome to both of you. Um, I'm usually on the other side, so this is the first time I've actually hosted a fireside chat, so I'm excited to uh, have the chance to uh, talk to you. I'm going to first kick it off with Ashani and then go to Patrick. I want to get your U.S. opinion, and then we'll go over to Patrick to look at uh, the Canadian perspective. But let me ask you, how do you feel tech contributes to both the U.S. and Canadian economies? And uh, happy to get your, your insights on that. 
Great to be with you this morning, uh, Mark. And I am also feeling the same way as you said your father um, would have uh, being on the panel with uh, Patrick here, because given what he has achieved seriously in terms of uh, creating one of the biggest tech companies, but the good he does every day through the innovations that he's involved in and his conservation work at Kenok um, and uh, many other things that he's involved in. So true honor to be on with, uh, with both of you. In terms of sort of the global shape, really technology obviously has become even more important since COVID in our personal lives, in our professional lives. And if we look, obviously, the share of technology in the global equity markets, if we just look at it that way, has increased to close to 25% if we look at different measures. And that is a huge part of the overall economy. If you look at venture, and, and Patrick knows a lot more about that than really any of us, um, he uh, can talk more about it. But uh, if you look at the total numbers, 300 billion spent, um, you know, and this year only in 2021, in the first half in the US, for example, 150 billion spent already. Um, um, on the venture side. So, so the numbers are getting larger. What I think is really, really interesting is that uh, investing in um, technology and investing particularly in the early stage companies used to be something that very sophisticated universities did or uh, very sophisticated investors uh, did. But now it's becoming more available really to the whole population. So looking forward, I feel this is the area, um, as we've seen also in the last uh, 18 months with COVID, that will continue to be the fastest growing area, taking advantage of the youth in the world, uh, in Canada, in uh, North America. And uh, with that, I'm going to pass it on back to you and to Patrick. Thank you. That's great. Patrick, love to get your insights. Well, I want to start by echoing a few of the key, key points that Afsani said. I mean, if you look at 15 years ago, the top companies by capitalization would have been, you know, General Electric, Exxon, you know, Intel, uh, Walmart. I think we're... I think we're losing Patrick a bit. Are we losing Patrick? Yeah, I think we're losing Patrick a bit. Um, uh, Patrick, we can't hear you. Let's see if we can get you. No, Is don't it, tell me I froze. Now, now, now we, did no, I, you're, you're, am I back? You're back now. You're back. Okay, sorry. So okay. I hope I, tell me where I broke. No, uh, uh, Intel, when you were saying companies like Intel. Oh okay. yeah. And so now in today's world, right, the top market they're not all these companies most of them are not on the top 10 top 15 list they're all tech right. and so the world is tech has completely transformed our economies and as i've said i said the, the most important point is covid has made what was a trend a necessity and every aspect of the economy now has to go digital at a breakthrough pace and that's what we see in the economy both in canada in the US, but also globally. And I think that that's what's amazing is that's why such an influx of capital in such a short period of time. For us, it's absolutely extraordinary to see. And that feels, we talk only about the big companies, but under the top of these icebergs are just this massive ecosystem that's rising. Right. And so clearly tech is at the heart of what our economies will be for the coming years and decades. Those are those are great insights from both of you. Do you feel that we can rely on tech to fuel the economy moving forward, or do we have to have a diversification strategy? I'll turn it over to Asani. Uh, I can jump in. Um, you know, what is, I think, interesting about tech, and Patrick can talk much more intelligently about this than I can, but it's in and of itself, obviously, it's very important, but if we look at Again, uh, since COVID, tech has entered the world of education, tech has entered the world of health, tech has entered the world of uh, property and real estate and, uh, and um, climate area. So, so it is not just, uh, you know, looking at it as a separate thing, but it's, as you uh, talked earlier this morning, the number of jobs that have got created just in Toronto, right? 
Just in Toronto, you've had huge amount of job creation in the tech sector. Uh, the same thing uh, we are seeing in the U.S., whether it is Austin, whether it is Miami, whether it's Chattanooga, which has provided um, uh, basically uh, almost free internet to its population and created the digital hub. So it's not just San Francisco, it's not just Palo Alto. Um, you're seeing all these cities that are creating new jobs and getting involved in new parts of tech. And when we talk about climate change, and again, Patrick is a leader, not just at Innovia with the new ventures that he's doing every day, but also in conservation and climate change, you can see how much of the new tech, new um, climate uh, investments are very highly intertwined with technology. Pat, thank you. Uh, again, from my side, Go ahead. Just, just to add to it, I think the key point that Aksaim said is, People think of tech as, okay, it's a corner of the economy, but in fact, it's not anymore. It's a horizontal play across every industry. If you think of material science, if you think of, uh, you know, even natural resources, if you think of logistics, if you think of manufacturing, tech is everywhere. Life sciences, right, and, and, and into financial services. Services. So it's not, okay, there's tech and then there's the rest of the economy. It's a real horizontal play that's really transforming all the aspects of all of these industries. And that's what's so cool about it. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Every, almost every company needs to be a tech company. The other day I was talking to a peer of mine uh, who runs one of the largest uh, uh, spirits company in the world, and they're doing a test, an AI technology test to track social media to, so, that their, so that their sales rep know what people are saying about specific bars and what they're drinking. So it's amazing what every company needs to do to really think about how they're utilizing tech. Um, how do you think governments should support the tech sector uh, and tech talent? Uh, and what role do you think government should actually play uh, in propping up the ecosystem or supporting the ecosystem? Asani, I'll go to you first and then over to Patrick. So, you know, government can uh, play a very positive role in the sense of, uh, again, like what we're just talking about, whether it is at the local level, like Chattanooga, I mentioned, you know, where the mayor has been, so, or successive series of mayors have, have uh, made tech available and internet available, whether it is to school kids or to hospitals or to high tech industry. Um, so, you know, if you look at uh, that is one way that uh, politicians can get involved in, obviously creating a vibrant um, set of regulations is also important. There is in the in the U.S., uh, of course, right now, there is a lot of uh, conversation about how tech should have some level of uh, regulation because it's become so powerful. Again, I don't know, Patrick, what your thoughts are on that. I think that, that Canada and the U.S. are in somewhat of a different position. I think that the industrial tech complex of the U.S. is basically formidable. And you're right that there's kind of corner cases about regulation. And, but I think that, that the, the flywheel of Silicon Valley is almost unstoppable. And in that sense, I think that in those areas, right, government just let go, right? And, and manage the corner cases. In Canada, we had a very different situation. You go back 10, 15 years, and it will go back 20, 25 years. For the last kind of quarter century, you know, Canada was a country of like one global champion every decade, right? You go way back, you have Nortel, and then there was nothing for 10 years. Then we had Rim Blackberry, and then there was nothing for 10 years. And so the Canadian government and the, the provincial governments have really made a big effort over the last decade to, you know, with programs like VCAP and uh, the Vicky programs to help these fund the funds to prime the pump into the ecosystem. And on that side, and then on the other side, through the education, of course. And then finally, in the case of Canada, we got a gift from your last president of Sané when they kind of stopped all the immigration of the brightest people of the world into the U.S. by canceling all these visas. Right. And so Canada was like, okay, we'll take them. <laughs> we'll take them in 30 days. And I think that these areas, I mean, it is a global competitive market for this talent. And I think that the Canadian government, and, and through the arms also, I should say, in Canada, of some of the pension funds. I mean, La Caisse de Dépôt and Placement du Québec, CDPQ, I mean, they make no bones about it. They've been really active in, in supporting the VC environment and the innovation and tech environment. 
and to the benefit really of the Canadian economy. And and I just want to kind of highlight the fact that but they put their money where their mouth is, right? And they let the BC world do what it should do. They're not telling us on Tuesday morning what to do. So all these ingredients are really important. And and let's not kid ourselves. Every country in the world right now has some government program because they know that it's the wealth of the future. Right. Yeah, I was just going to mention, if I may, uh, yeah, you course. know, uh, when I've uh, been in Canada visiting with um, uh, leaders, including, you know, I met, I was fortunate to meet with Mr. Trudeau and others. First of all, one of the things I noticed also in Canada specifically is that you see more women in tech, both in government, governing and sort of regulating tech, but also in the business. And I know that Patrick in uh, Inovia and his other work has always had more than you know, a very large share of, uh, of women. And I think uh, it is important to highlight the fact it's something that we also do at Rock Creek. In fact, the government of Canada had this program called the Equality Fund, and we work with the Equality Fund and the Toronto Foundation very specifically on bringing more women into different areas globally, but including tech. Uh, I, I'm glad you mentioned that. One of our board members on Toronto Global, Jody Kovic, founded an organization that focuses exactly on that and bringing young women and young young girls at a very early age into tech. I think it's so critical for our economy and diversifying uh, it as well. Do you think, um, um, I want to move on to the comments or the conversation we talked about, the investment by VCs. The mayor mentioned it as well. You know, we had a record number in 2021 uh, in the Toronto region, over a billion dollars. You know, Patrick, you're very involved in the Canadian marketplace as well as globally. Um, what do you think is fueling this investment in the Toronto region and in Canada uh, from the VC community? I think this is a global issue. So let me make you my little napkin answer in 30 seconds. All these pension funds out there, they used to be 50% debt, 50% equities. I mean, I'm making a really rough number. Mm -hmm. And now all their debt has gone to zero yield. And they still have an obligation to get 8% for their pensions and their liabilities. So now you have trillions of dollars that are looking for yield and are looking for alternate assets on one side. On the other side, you have what we discussed a bit earlier on the supply side, COVID, the fundamental breakthroughs in so many of the tech technologies, I mean, and, and the rise of these giants, I've kind of highlighted to the world that all these horizontal plays need to be built, and they are being built. So coming back to just our Canadian experience, I told you a minute ago that Canada used to have a champion every decade. Well, in the last five years, we went from a champion every decade to a champion every year. And right now, a champion, like if you think of, you know, you know billion-dollar capitalization and up, we now have that almost every quarter we have one in Canada. And so it fuels the enthusiasm. So both supply and demand is matching at a time where there's a huge amount of supply and for good reasons and a huge supply of demand for good reasons. So we shouldn't be surprised by this kind of rising tide. It's really exciting, but it's still, I mean, from a VC perspective, um, you still need to do your homework. I mean, there's no free lunch, right? There's really great deals and there's terrible deals. And so, you know, it requires a lot of discipline. No, I, I completely agree with you. I'm involved in the tech sector and a bunch of incubators here uh, in the in Canada, uh, and you see the excitement of the Shopify's of the world of Wealth Simples and the and the unicorn status that they have. I think that is fueling the next generation. We hope that ecosystem is like the Israeli ecosystem, where it supports each other. And I think that's one of the things we're starting to see in the Toronto region. Afsani, where else are you seeing this around the world? You mentioned it. You know, I think one of you mentioned about over 100 or several hundred billion being invested with VCs. What are the markets are you seeing this trend in as well? I think, you know, we talked about Canada, obviously, and, and by the way, Toronto obviously is super important, but uh, other uh, areas in Canada are also increasing in, uh, in uh, tech and in VC investments. And Patrick uh, knows a lot more about that. But also, by the way, there are a lot of Canadian entrepreneurs, right? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, 
Patrick, that you work with all over the world. All uh, over the world. So, so it might be that the VC is in a particular country in Europe or in, um, in Silicon Valley, but in fact, they're of Canadian origin. Um, so that, that, I think, is a very expanding area. But uh, where we see, you know, obviously, it used to be uh, very specific areas like uh, Palo Alto, like, um, you know, um, starting to um, expand in New York. But as I was mentioning earlier, in, within the U.S., you're seeing a lot of other cities, you know, in uh, Florida, let's say, whether it's Miami or Tampa Bay or other cities that are seeing a big growth. Uh, in Denver, Colorado, you're seeing a lot of growth. I mentioned Austin already. And then if you come out, obviously, Northern Europe has been very active also. It's been very quiet. I think like Canada, they kind of have been doing it quietly and very effectively and in a very smart way. Um, so you see a lot in uh, Northern Europe um, and Scandinavian countries. Interestingly, uh, Spain, you know, both Madrid and Barcelona, you see pools of talent that have been really important. And not to not mention, obviously, the other huge giant, which has been China and Northern Asia and India. Um, so, so there you see um, a huge amount of growth, uh, and I think the big question will be whether you see a bifurcation where, uh, particularly in North Asia, China, you know, VC and technology get more locally invested, while North America also becomes more uh, local versus you know, investing in China. Uh, and I think for me, uh, looking globally, that is the big question for the next few years as to whether you have two worlds uh, or or these two worlds, you know, go back to the way they work together. Um, I, if you ask me today, I would assume that there will be more bifurcation. Well, you know, I was being very Canadian, I think, in that question, allowing you to talk about other places beyond just promoting Toronto, which is <laughs> which what we're doing. But that great insights. And I love, Patrick, your comment uh, before about, you know, the United States, we really have benefited from the previous president. You know, the fact that we have homegrown talent being the most educated, uh, you know, region of, of any OECD country in the world um, is quite amazing. And the whole homegrown talent and then the ability to rapidly bring people into the country, I think, is what is fueling this. As we think about these young entrepreneurs and, and uh, these young tech leaders and founders in this new economy, in this new world, and I'll start with you, Patrick. Um, how do you think they can scale? Do you think uh, it changes the way they can scale? Do, do they have to think differently about growing their businesses in the new world that we're in now? The short answer is yes. And because of this acceleration of, of the tech ecosystem, uh, founders, and especially in the scaling portion, it's accelerated. So whatever, you know, what in the old days you had time, to kind of scale, now you don't have time. You have, it's a race. Immediately when your product works, there'll be five copycats that will try to steal your lunch. And so you are in a race. And so that means the implication for founders is you gotta get a great board. Because with a great board, you can get access to all their networks, all their wisdom, make genuinely new mistakes, not yesterday's mistakes because they've done them all. So get a great board, make sure that you attract talent and pay them don't be scared to pay them global rates like i think in canada we're often kind of like well i don't know and just pay them market wages and just get a players hire a players and b players hire c players just get the a players and you'll get 90 percent of your gang right there and then finally i think that it's important that you make sure that your business is one where your your technology stack that you built it can scale too often we say, okay, we'll do V1 and then we'll figure it out. But if it can't scale, you'll hit a wall super fast. So make sure you have the infrastructure. And today with cloud, you have no excuse not to do that. Right. So if you do these three things, I think that you have a real shot at it. Yeah, Asani, you talked about the importance of young girls and young women in tech. What advice would you give these young founders? And uh, that I'm sure you talked to many of them uh, who are looking, seeking your, your guidance. Um, I think the first advice would be try to work for Patrick uh, if you can, uh, <laughs> if you can, <laughs> because seriously, I think um, it's really important whether you're working for another, you know, whether you're working with teams of other women or other men or, you know, um, really any other group, uh, to have people who are going to, um, you know, 
be supported, as it were. Uh, continue to train. I think, you know, we all are in a world where we need to learn every day girls and boys and men and women, uh, younger and older. And I think, um, you know, it's not enough to just get your degree and jump in. And I think a lot of women, by the way, globally, but you see a lot of women in Canada, in fact, going into areas like STEM. Um, but it will be an ongoing education, so don't think of it as one thing. And I think what Patrick said, I think having this mentor, you know, whether it is in your board, if you can get them in your board, if you can't get them in your board, having mentors, just continue to add to your mentors as you go along. That will be like the biggest investment, best investment you can make. That's great. Um, I'm sorry, if I may just allow me just to chip in on one last thing on that women issue. And it's really about diversity. I think that as Canadians, certainly I'll speak for Toronto, I'll speak for Canada. We have no excuse. We have all the women engineers, we have all of the, the diversity from every socioeconomic race, religion. We have them all in Canada. That's what Toronto is. It is the amazing. So every startup CEOs, you have no excuse not to have an amazing company that is fully diverse. Like, no excuse. Patrick. Just get on with it. Uh, amen, hallelujah, I completely agree with you. I think that's a, a great observation, a great comment. Um, I'll wrap up with this final question. Um, you know, we are a tech hotspot in North America on a global stage. Do you feel the way that people are working now, young people can work anywhere in the world? Do you think that's going to hurt cities like Toronto or Silicon Valley or New York or, you know, in terms of getting people to actually come here and be a part of this amazing ecosystem that is happening? Uh, Patrick, why don't we go to you first? I'll jump in. I think this, this is an amazing asset for Toronto. I think that there's, this is a win-win for everybody. Mm -hmm. you, you know, if, you're, if your company is really hitting success, you don't need to scale. And if you need to scale, you need to hire the best talent. To have your core team in Toronto and the half of your team elsewhere, mm -hmm. it's just a huge asset to you. I mean, so many companies have proven through COVID that this decentralized model can actually work very effectively. And, and so the hybrid model is gonna be there for a long time. And, and so you should embrace it without having to sacrifice. Look, locally, if you can find as much talent as you can, there's always a benefit to being able to, in the same room to fight for the pin on the whiteboard. So let's not discount that. But, uh, but it's a real win-win on both sides. Great. Thanks, Patrick. Fani, final words? Uh, the only thing I would add, uh, Mark, to what Patrick said is uh, really uh, one thing, which is, as he said, it is the world of hybrid. It is the world where we all need to be more flexible, but we also need to work uh, physically to get there also. I see a huge advantage for Canada in general and Toronto specifically. You know, you create really great environments, but also the importance of social values is going to be is very important for you mm -hmm. and the new generations that are coming into these new companies they want to have you know good compensation they want to work with really smart people they also care about the values and they also care to work in an environment that cares about the environment so that is a huge asset in toronto and uh, and i think that that will continue to be an asset well, I, I want to wrap up by saying thank you to both of you for being part of this conversation about a city and a region that we truly love. I am 55 years old and I learned a lot today, so you can still teach an old dog new tricks. So uh, thank you very much. And I, we really appreciate you taking the time to talk to a truly global audience. And next year, we hope to have you here in person. Uh, turn it over to Stephen. <laughs> Uh, you know, that, that was a fantastic panel. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, look, there's so much to take away from that. Um, I was really fortunate to meet Patrick years ago in his role in Google and Silicon Valley. I've had chats with Afsani. I'm looking forward to seeing her in Toronto. But look, um, I just, some, a few things jumped out at me. COVID has made what was a trend a necessity. Technology is everywhere. Hire the best. There's an explosion of opportunities. The importance of a good board and good mentors. The importance of women in, women in tech. And I think finally it was uh, the importance of going to work with Patrick. So again, um, really great panel. So uh, fortunate to have two real world leaders join us today. Now we're going to go to a uh, video by uh, Mayor Bonnie Crombie, the mayor of Mississauga who's also been a, a, a tremendous leader through this
pandemic and also someone who's uh, passionate about her city and about driving economic growth. So over to Mayor Crombie, thank you. Hello, I'm Bonnie Crombie, Mayor of the great city of Mississauga. And it's a pleasure to join you virtually for the Stronger Than Ever Summit hosted by Toronto Global. This summit provides an opportunity for businesses in the Toronto region to discuss the reopening of our economy and the competitive advantages of being located right here in the greater Toronto area. In the last two decades, Mississauga has solidified its position as a place where people choose to be, where businesses choose to grow and to thrive. We have shed our suburban image, joining cities around the world in ushering in the urban millennium. And we're changing how we grow by embracing mixed-use communities with a focus on health, quality of life, and job creation. In fact, the city of Mississauga has received five awards from Foreign Direct Investment Magazine as this year's winner for Mid-Sized City of the Future in all the Americas for a strong economic performance. The criteria for the award looks at infrastructure, incentives and capabilities of cities and regions for attracting future inward investment. And I'm incredibly proud of the city's economic development team and Toronto Global for working together to put Mississauga on the map on a global scale. Thanks to this partnership, we have recently attracted significant new investments to our city including businesses like HCL Technologies and Infosys, who are joining us here at the summit. Mississauga's key sectors of growth include information technology, smart logistics, advanced manufacturing, and life sciences. We are home to over 75 Fortune 500 companies, over 1,400 multinational firms, more than 150 languages are spoken in our city, and we are serviced by seven major highways. And we're proud to be home to Canada's largest and busiest airport, Toronto Pearson International Airport. Mississauga is an economic powerhouse, a hub for jobs, commerce, and international investment. We are a critical component to Canada's economic growth by creating higher paying jobs, expanding trade, boosting productivity, providing access to new technologies, encouraging innovation, and linking Canadian firms to the global supply chains. As we emerge from the global pandemic, we want to come back stronger than ever. And with Toronto Global, a goal of ensuring that the Toronto region leads our country's recovery and cements its place as the best location for investment in North America. I know brighter days are ahead. We're building a stronger, more inclusive, more resilient Toronto region for the future. Thank you. Take it all in. Show up early. Stay late. Really late. Live your passion. Leave an impression. Commit. Get out. Get in. Embrace the moment. Hold. 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 Ah. <laughs> Overdo it. Do more. Leave less. Breathe. Get the bag. Keep one packed. Don't put it off. Because when we make it count, we rise higher. Welcome back. Thank you, Mayor Crombie, and thank you again for your partnership and your great leadership. We're moving into our next session, talking about technology. We're so fortunate to have some great leaders with some great companies joining us today. As, as we heard earlier, Technology is everywhere. It's gonna drive the economy. It's not so much a vertical, it's horizontal. It's how we do business and it is so, so, so important. And how we're gonna live and learn, how we're gonna adapt, what's it gonna look like, what are the skill sets like. We're gonna hear some of those things today. But speaking of technology, I'm also looking forward to the days of no Zoom, to getting back into talking to people 
uh, in real life. Um, you know, what the most overused words in the English language are today, you're on mute. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to getting past those days. So let's get going on our next panel. Aaron Ellison joined Pinterest as the country manager for Canada in 2018, and in 2020 June, her remit expanded to include the Asia Pacific area. Sabrina Jeremiah, VP and country manager for Google in Canada. Sabrina leads the strategic direction of Google's cross-functional business strategy in Canada and Google's advertising business. Jen Wong is Reddit's chief operating officer overseeing business strategy and related teams from Reddit's New York office. Finally, joining us late at night from India is CK Kumar, otherwise known as CVK, the chief executive officer and managing director of HCL Technologies. HCL has been named the fastest growing large technology company in the world for four consecutive years. I also want to point out um, the last panel we talked about uh, women in technology. I want to point out that three of our four leaders today are women in technology. So thank you for joining us. To moderate this discussion, we are joined by Greg Bunnell, anchor and host of The Real Economy on BNN Bloomberg. Greg, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm really looking forward to this topic and the speakers on this topic because I was telling them just before we came live uh, to all of you, I have been broadcasting from home for a year and a half and I was astounded by the technology that made it possible. I didn't think it was going to work a cell phone, a laptop, but it's happened. I host two to three hours of live TV every day. And then starting next week on Monday, I'm going back into the studio proper. So I'm just right on that line and questioning myself, how has tech changed after the pandemic? I do want to start things off rather easy, though. We are talking about building Toronto here. And I wanted to get some quick thoughts from the panel at first about the city of Toronto. I mean, everybody wants to win tech talent in the 21st century. 21st century. What does Toronto actually have? I'm going to start with CVK, CVK and get your thoughts on that. I mean, what does Toronto offer to the world that makes it a place for you to want to invest? Yeah, Greg, that's a great start. And as you would know, uh, we recently set up a, a digital innovation center in Mississauga in uh, Toronto. And we have plans to hire 2,000 uh, digital talent across Canada in the next three years. So if I were to look at what are the three most important factors, I would say talent. Toronto region is home to the third largest pool of tech talent in North America, and it's also one of the fastest growing. So clearly, Toronto's calling card is uh, talent for global tech companies like us. And the second and uh, equally important is the, the technology ecosystem. While individual companies and successes, uh, breakthrough innovation is all well appreciated and we all understand it. But a true and sustainable uh, success in any segment or any sector uh, is going to be where you have institutionalized collaboration. And I think uh, the tech ecosystem the innovation hubs, the accelerators, uh, they all really help in scaling incubation, innovation, and things like that. And it, it in fact, I um, was very pleasantly surprised uh, uh, with a uh, lot of investments in the next-gen technology in Toronto and in Canada, uh, like the Vector Institute for Artificial Intelligence, Canadian Institute for Advanced Research. So lots of interesting tech ecosystems that's getting created. Uh, and again, the most progressive government policies. Uh, I was uh, very, very happy to see that there was a pan-Canadian artificial intelligence strategy and a national quantum strategy. These are very forward-looking and it's, it's really a great, uh, great uh, place for technology companies to 
really invest and grow the talent and the service portfolio out of Toronto. Okay, I'm going to start moving through the panel. I know from having been on panels myself before that the first speaker advantage means now you have to think, okay, that's what I was going to say. What am I going to add to the conversation? Uh, Jen, I'm going to throw it to you. What's attractive about Toronto? Uh, thanks for having me. So, so many things. Um, I mean, we have been sort of, I'm certainly eyeing the, the talent in Toronto for, for a while. We discussed that in Reddit. Um, there's a lot of incredible, incredibly diverse and talented um, you know, technology, uh, a capable workforce, which we're really excited about. But also, you know, as we have planned our international expansion, there's just a lot of really great sales and uh, operating and product town as well in Toronto. So actually, our, um, our head of consumer product for all of our international and global expansion is in Toronto. Um, we were now I think 27 in Toronto, 33 in Canada uh, writ large, and we continue to grow. So um, we see it as a really great opportunity for expanding talent across a multitude of different um, uh, different skill sets. Um, and we've been there just you know a little over 12 months at this point. All right, we got two good marks so far for Toronto. Uh, Sabrina, I'm going to throw it to you. I don't know why there's something about Google that makes me think Google exists up there on the guy in the cloud somewhere but of course you have physical locations you have Toronto locations uh, why, why do you need a base in Toronto yeah well you know uh, Peter Ustinov calls Toronto New York run by the Swiss um, I think that gives a nod to the fact that it's, it's a pretty fantastic place to work I mean it runs well and it's uh, you know it's 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 very cosmopolitan but I think what that says to me is it's a place that as a global headquarters you are going to be building products that serve the world and I think that's what global tech companies need to do is they need to headquarter in places that have the talent and the talent that is diverse. And we are extremely diverse here um, that is educated. And I think we, we've heard a lot about all of the great education. And you want to be in a tech ecosystem that has density. And I think Toronto does have density. We have anchor tenants like Google, like Microsoft. We have emerging scale-ups. We have startups. We have an amazing incubator kind of support ecosystem for tech in Canada. And the way we collaborate is pretty amazing. Like I think it's it's different to a lot of other ecosystems that I've seen. So I'm super bullish on Toronto. Bullish on Toronto, Aaron, you're gonna round out the group with your thoughts, what do you think? Oh, thanks a lot, Greg. Uh, I think Toronto's terrible, you know? Uh, <laughs> there you go, the other <laughs> one. Uh, well, I, I would just, I, I wanna just plus one to all of that. Um, and, and, you know, just build on, on, on what Sabrina said in particular, um, we all know, and I'm sure it's been said already this morning that uh, Toronto home is home to 200 plus ethnic groups, 140 languages spoken. And at Pinterest, we have 450 million people globally who use our product. And whether we are uh, operating the company, building new core products focused on, on other tools, it's incredibly important that uh, the cities we invest in house people who can create the type of diverse product experience that that really is, is composite of, of who uses uh, Pinterest today. And so for us, um, uh, Toronto is our first international engineering hub, which we're incredibly excited about. Um, the talent pool is, is broad and deep, uh, and we're particularly uh, excited about all of the machine learning talent in Toronto. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, for our shopping technology, we will house uh, the, the, the primary set of engineers here in Toronto. So there's both breadth and depth and capability, as well as a, d a diversity of perspective uh, that's incredibly unique uh, to Toronto. So we're very excited about our investment here. All right, so everyone who's in the audience who has, uh, you know, a vested interest in Toronto, just heard some good things about our city, what we have to offer the world on the tech front. This is something I have heard throughout the pandemic when I interview different people from the technology sector on my show. The fact that the pandemic, bed of necessity, pulled sort of the technological revolution forward by several years. That's always left me with the question of, uh, okay, if we sort of jump three or four or five years ahead of where we would have been without the pandemic, do we have any gas left in the tank? I'm going to throw this one to Jen to start. I mean, um, just that, that general idea that, okay, we pulled everything forward, so what's next? Do we have a breather period here? I think so, actually. I think things are continuing to accelerate um, on a number of fronts. At least that's what we've we've seen uh, the platform, you know, on the platform. And you know, for example, e 
commerce. This is an area, and I'm sure uh, Aaron Screen and people have, have seen this. It's just accelerated in turn, and the the patterns in which people are buying their path to purchase are really really changing. So, for example, we're seeing a lot more um, research happen within communities, within you know, uh, hey, I'm shopping for a vacuum cleaner, and I I want it. I want real life experience from real life people around specific products used before. Um, before I'm purchasing, or um, really seeing an accelerated instinct and just, you know, how are people placing their money and retail and individuals wanting to get involved in the market and help each other um, think about how to invest their money and take advantage of sort of alternative investing approaches and as well as the fintechs. Um, I'd say the final one that, again, I continues to accelerate, and you see the statistics on this, we see this on Reddit, quite a bit is creators and the idea that um you know that a, a, a lot of folks who are you know the sort of gen z really um really believe that you know maybe 40 50 percent want to spend their time being creators viewed as a vibrant part of, of who they are and we're seeing this activity more and more during the pandemic this accelerated where a lot of people were going live and drawing and playing music and baking and and just sharing the things that they're passionate about with strangers and having other strangers engage and and love it and having it become a part of their their life and um these behaviors you know we sort of saw them a year ago and they've only accelerated so i think i'm probably in the camp of feeling like some of the changes in secular changes in behavior will just actually continue. And that's exciting. I, just, really interesting I like the it is exciting. I like the idea of the creator in the sense that all this technology has a lot of a lot of people who perhaps face barriers before to get in there. Pinterest. There's something about Pinterest there and that makes me think uh, of acts of creation. Uh, I want you to pick up on that theme, maybe talk about uh some of the places you want to go. If, if you had to pull forward, I guess, some of your strategies uh, during the pandemic, I guess you have to have a whole bag of new strategies for these creators. Yeah, thank you. I think that um, in this past year is that and is also a place for people to be productive and positive. And in terms of productivity, uh, people turn to Pinterest for uh, sheer mechanisms for survival. Uh, you know, if you'd never cooked before uh, and suddenly you had all these kids at home and you had to produce dinner and you had to homeschool, people really turn to Pinterest to get ideas online to make their offline reality better and they had to be really agile about changing and learning new skills and tools. We also uh, discovered that in doing that um, in using Pinterest, which has always been our purpose for people to be inspired and try new things, people felt good when they did new things. They discovered in a pandemic they needed an indoor garden. Uh, they tried uh, new hobbies and all of that actually through research demonstrated that it made people feel more positive. And so I think uh, technology uh, became more purposeful and will continue to be more purposeful uh, and serve a role not just in passive consumption of content, but in using content to actually uh, enrich your life experience offline. And, to, and, online. and enrich some people in the traditional way in terms of enrichment. I think of YouTube and how it spawns entire generations of new stars. I don't fully get it being the age that I am, but my sons fully get it. So Sabrina, I want to throw that to you in the in the terms of uh, people just being able to use the technology, being able to use a vehicle like YouTube to sort of reach out. To, was there a shift during the pandemic? I mean, I know they existed before, but during the pandemic, what kind of activity did we see? Yeah, I mean, I think what we saw now, I like to think of it as like the watermark for digital acceleration went up. And I think a lot of the habits are going to stick, right? Like we have all become more digitally enabled on everything we do whether it's my 91 year old dad who is actually giving YouTube lessons to his like relatives uh, through Google Home Hubs, or whether it is the teachers that have all, are all learning how to use Google Classroom today. I think on YouTube, I mean, the creator aspect of it is amazing. There's about 34,000 full-time jobs with YouTube in Canada right now. And these are folks that are creating and doing new things, they're teaching. And I think everyone has just said this is like, technology is a tool to get things done. And I think just the helpfulness across everything, like we all had to go through so much and Canadians had to go through and global, like everyone went through so much. 
it was a tool to be able to connect to people you loved. It was a tool to be able to educate when we couldn't get into classrooms. It's a tool to get information that is accessible and important to what you need at that moment. And so I think our ability to use technology and digital as a tool has increased. And from here, I, I think we're just gonna be able to solve more problems. When I was running into problems early in this foray into home broadcasting, it had to do to a certain degree with infrastructure. So CVK, I wanna ask you for all the great things people are doing online, how did you feel about the state of Canada's internet infrastructure heading in to the pandemic? Was it robust to, enough to meet all these challenges? Uh, yes, absolutely, Greg. I think Toronto was one of the better equipped cities from the perspective of technology. We service over 70 plus top uh, Canadian companies. Uh, and uh, I think uh, our teams could work very seamlessly remotely and we, we service some of the leading telecom providers as well. So I think uh, the, the whole infrastructure held up very well. And I think in one of the surveys, uh, I think Tuft University conducted, I think Toronto came up among the top 10 cities which really did well, the, the technology infrastructure did well during the pandemic. Aaron, what do you think from Pinterest's point of view? Did you sort of have all of the sort of the back line support in this country that you needed to do what you're doing in front of the house? Absolutely, we did. And, and to, to, to sort of the credit of a platform like Google, we were already, for us, an organization that was used to working uh, on documents in real time and collaborating in real time. And this just accelerated um, our, our need to do that. But th thankfully, we were ready. I would also say, though, like many leaders here uh, that are on the call, and certainly Sabrina, we have the chance to work with many leaders across the company, across all sectors. Uh, and thank you to the infrastructure th uh, strength. Um, many of them were able to be very agile in suddenly having to produce a, a great e-commerce experience, curbside uh, pickup mechanisms that didn't exist, as well as uh, even bringing call center workers uh, into the home, which many of the people I spoke to never thought that would be possible. And so um, the infrastructure was there and the talent was there to make really agile shit in business strategy to serve Canadians at this time. I want to make clear to the panel that I'm going to start jumping around for questions and not everyone's going to get a chance uh, for to answer every question, unless you really feel strongly and then jump in there and cut me off. But I did want to throw out uh, one for Jen right now, but social interaction moving online. I, in the old days, on a Thursday, after work, we'd go across the street to the frickin' pub and we'd have a social with our coworkers. That moved online, it felt very strange at first, and now it just feels routine. As people feel more routine being online, Jen, where's the business opportunity for tech-focused companies as, as we just sort of enter this new age of saying, it's not so strange to talk to people this way? Yeah, I think, um, you know, it always starts with the consumer and what it is that that people want and i always believe that you can build a business you know around that um but uh, as i mentioned before i think what was really interesting about social interaction is people are really willing to spend time first of all with with strangers um and they're willing to spend time with strangers in what i call a feeling of presence so you know i think what people craved during the pandemic was the connection and the feeling of presence is when two people might be online at the same time. They might be live in video talking to each other. We saw this with Reddit Live. They might be playing music. They might be asking each other questions. They may not know each other, but they may have come in through a community where they both love baking or they both love art or they both, you know, play the piano. And that was that's probably one of the most profound and deep social interactions that we saw emerge that has really continued. And I think, you know, we now have seen people start to award each other. It's very interesting to, to, to buy awards and to want to start to tip each other and, and really want to give, you know, show appreciation to each other. That behavior, I think, will continue. And so, you know, you can start to see what the the nexus of like a value exchange is in that new social interaction. I think we're at the beginning of it. Um, and I, you know, I always believe a business will emerge from that, but that's just such a, I think an interesting, like profound kind of experience and social interaction that just didn't exist before. And now it's just so casual and is so comfortable that's emerged. Um, 
And we, we've seen that a lot in all of our communities. Sabrina, I want to ask you what that does to a workplace culture. I have been to Google's headquarters in Toronto a couple a couple times doing various interviews over the year. Frankly, it looked like a fun place to work, a lot more fun than a newsroom. Uh, but with people doing remote kind of work, how do you keep and feeling pretty good about it, as, as Jen was saying? Sabrina, how do you sort of keep that workplace culture alive when people communicate through phones and laptops? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the one benefit, and I think going back to what Aaron was saying, is just the resilience of all the businesses. And we were very fortunate in that we create the tool that keeps a lot of businesses across Canada connected called Google Workspace. And just one thing to note, like in terms of technical infrastructure, uh, before the pandemic, six out of 10 companies in Canada just did not have this capacity to work remotely from home. So the fact that we're all here doing this is no short of a small miracle. I mean, we were seeing 2 million people uh, a day, 2 million businesses uh, just like joining Google Meets in the early parts of the, the pandemic because it was so essential. So we're all here in this format. Um, what I like to think about is where will it land and how do we kind of pivot to the future? So our view is that uh, we really believe in a hybrid workplace so that the future will have a mix of work from home and it will have a mix of remote and it's going to be tailored to different types of work. Uh, there will be flexible work weeks and flexibility within that. And in this moment now that in Canada, we're still not all fully into this hybrid um, area. I think it's just like, how do, you, how do you grow culture? How do you maintain culture? Uh, so many people have started and have never set foot in an office, right? I think that goes for all of us here. So we do a lot of things. We uh, we do Monday meetings, um, you know, kickoffs where we get everyone together. We over-index in storytelling and in culture. Um, we really look at engagement with our employees. So getting them engaged on things from diversity and inclusion to employment resource groups, uh, to culture, to giving back in the community. I think that's a really important thing. And I think another thing that sets Toronto apart is that we're all very invested in Toronto as a com community, whether it's like things like shop here or the Google career certificates that we've invested in to get Canadians um, enhanced with digital skills. So I think there's a lot of that. One common theme probably for all of us is that the role of the manager matters so much right now in this remote working. And like, you know, that is where the rubber hits the road. It's the ability of managers to have one-to-one -one conversations uh, and not just do everything at scale and really kind of, you know, make sure people are okay, check in and then bring together moments of celebration, storytelling. You can create the culture online, but I have to say for me personally, I'm very excited to move to a hybrid uh, future when we get there. Along those lines, uh, CVK, I want to ask you this, because you talked about the expansion you're doing, the jobs that you're uh, hiring for in Canada. I, I've known several people during the pandemic who have left being in Bloomberg or left another job, and they get onboarded, but they get onboarded digitally, right? They get onboarded yeah. through an online environment. What does that look like when you're going out and hiring people for HCL and they're not going to come into an office? I mean, that's the way I've started every job in my life, going into an office, meeting people, getting trained. Yeah, I mean, Greg, it's it's hard to kind of really start a new job remotely. And uh, during the last 18 months, uh, globally, we would have hired uh, uh, over 25,000 people in, uh, in 50 countries in 200 locations. Uh, but uh, virtually everybody was onboarded remotely. And uh, I think, uh, as uh, Sabrina mentioned, I think just onboarding getting them productive i think that's the relatively easy job but how do you really imbibe them into the culture how do you really inspire them about your philosophy of uh, how you work how you interact with customers uh, and i think a lot of smaller group settings really helps in training uh, not so formal settings a little bit informal uh, sessions with no agenda, but to just have a conversation with a team of people and then bring in some very experienced talent in your company, bring some young talent, and then really enable that interaction. I mean, very much like what you would do in an office environment. How can you make it a little informal in a, in a, in a virtual world? I think that's where the trick lies. Uh, but I personally think... Uh, the virtual environments do not really replace the real environment. I think, uh, I mean, the center of gravity for any organization uh, will always remain some kind of location or physical infrastructure. 
the inspiration, the culture, all of that, the center of gravity is going to be a place where uh, people meet physically. And I think uh, the one fundamental reason for that is, uh, I think all of us live with our memories, the memories that get curated with various experiences that we get. I think that's what really uh, lasts longer and I think physical interactions has a much stronger memory and association uh, than virtual interactions. Uh, for that reason, I do believe uh, uh, we, we, we are very keen to get uh, our talent into our offices for some limited time, uh, but really uh, kind of evolve into a hybrid, more flexible operating environment uh, than either being fully virtual or fully physical. I like that idea of center of gravity, because even though I live in the suburbs, the center of gravity for me for my entire journalism career has been the city of Toronto, right downtown. Uh, I believe Ravi Kumar, the president of Infosys, is in, involved in this one of the sessions today or speaking. I had a great conversation with him on the show a couple of weeks ago, and I was talking to him in Toronto. And then he sort of threw out the idea that do you worry about this, do you worry about that? And he said, who said you have to live? in Toronto proper to work for us in one of those Toronto jobs. And that was an intriguing thought. So Aaron, I want to ask you about that, about how you feel about uh, perhaps what's been a pretty much a big revolution in the, in the tech industry, people living pretty far away from home base. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. We have, while we have about 200 locations today, people work from maybe 25,000 locations for us, right? I mean, people could work from anywhere and, uh, uh, any time zone and also the working models have become a lot more flexible it's not an eight hour day or a five days a week it's it's a couple of days of intense work a couple of days of uh, less intense work so all those uh, flexibility in the operating environment flexibility of location uh, all of that is is new and i think it's tremendously helpful in in servicing the huge uh, uptick in the demand for digital services across the globe. How do you feel about that over at Pinterest, Aaron? Does that make sense? I just think about really tech-driven jobs from home and sometimes fool people into thinking I'm in a studio. Then uh, there must be other jobs that could be fully remote. Well, absolutely. Um, there's no binary answer to anything. For us, we have two kind of very clear beliefs uh, about uh, the future of work. One is that in-person collaboration is valuable, as everybody has said here. There are certain uh, ambiguous problems that need to be solved in person. That that you know, cr create a an in-person creates a different trust making space that's very very important. But we similarly believe that great work can be done anywhere. Now, anywhere can mean working independently at home, collaborating from home, uh, and collaborating from an office. So here in Toronto, specifically, we have invested uh, significantly in physical space. In fact, 50,000 square feet of office space. Uh, in these, with, with these beliefs in mind, one of those floors being fully dedicated just to collaboration. Uh, and everybody ultimately is going to need flexibility and choice. We've been working this way for 18 months. There's a bi-directional trust that's developed between employers and employees. And a common understanding um, that flexibility will create the best type of work. And I think that's the ethos of, of, of what we're saying today and, and really the ethos of Toronto, because you can live in the city, you can live in the suburbs as, as you do. Um, and none of that prohibits your access to both uh, your, your home your home office space, as well as a really, really um, interesting and diverse environment uh, of a physical space. Sabrina, when it comes to the work that Google does, obviously, if you're working for Google, you have an affinity for tech. You might even love tech. Uh, as we talk about the broader tech revolution for every workplace, is there a danger that some people fall behind? How do we make sure we bring everyone along on this journey, Sabrina? Well, I think that's a, that's a great question. And, and it's it's critical, again, like, you know, we're building products for the world. We need to bring everyone along. And it's, it's, it's critical. Um, I would say there's a couple of things as it pertains to diversity and also but digital skills. We are really vested in investing in digital skills in Canada. Um, we have a, a large platform of micro-credentials under a, the banner of Grow with Google. 
And I, I actually had the chance to meet during the pandemic, people, you know, uh, remote opportunities to talk to people, uh, a bunch of young graduates who actually graduated from some of these career certificate programs. These are things like data science, um, different things to do with marketing, different things to do with project management that you can actually do these courses in six to 12 months. And when I talked to them, what was amazing is that the majority of them came from underrepresented groups. Uh, they had actually worked in places like retail, like they had no digital skills. And then six to 12 months, they trained up and had landed in jobs that were good, high quality digital jobs, much like many of the ones that we're talking about on this call. And we're so happy. I have never actually been so inspired by a group of people and telling me about their career paths and how excited they were and how this gave them a sense of purpose and passion in the middle of a pandemic to retrain, think about that, uh, and then completely convert their career path to a digital one. So I think it's really promising that the data that we have is that the people who graduated with one of our partners, Empower, 83% uh, of them have landed jobs and are very similar to the folks that I spoke to. So I think it's it's intentional moves like this, like really leaning into digital skill training, making sure we include everyone on this. Um, and another example I'll give is our investment with Digital Main Street in Shop Here. So we've helped to bring 25,000 businesses online. Over 60% of these are woman-led and over a third are BIPOC-led. And there's close to a thousand students who again are training up in digital skills. So I, I see so much potential in Canadians and their ability to actually grow their skills and really be part of this community uh, that, you know, every business is a tech business. So it's no longer the tech community. Every business uh, will be laced with some sort of technology. Yeah, it's good to hear that tech doesn't have to be scary because it does scare some people. Jen, from Reddit's point of view, I mean, when I think about Reddit, it's almost a different way of communicating as well. Uh, sort of following on that theme of bringing people along with the tech revolution, even different ways of communication, whether people are you know, microblogging or whether they're using Reddit. Uh, how do you sort of bring along the greater part of society to understand your vehicle? Yeah, um, it's a good question. I think, I think you know, one of the things about Reddit that's been true for the 15 years since we've been founded is that it's actually, it's a very simple platform. In fact, the majority of Reddit today still is text. Um, there's images and there's video now and it's getting you know more mobile and, and, and obviously uh, multimedia. But the majority of what happens on Reddit is conversation. And it's very simple. It starts with what are you interested in? And then either asking a question, writing a post or voting or commenting on what somebody else has said. And what we found is actually onboarding is easy because you know you start with what are you interested in? Is it sports? Is it gardening? Whatever it is. And the bar for entering Reddit, it, it it's not that high because it's not like you have to turn a camera on yourself or produce a video or even expose yourself from a PII standpoint. It's just you and what you're interested in and reading maybe comments and thoughts from other people who are interested in gardening. In my case, I learned how to garden during the pandemic, went very, very deep in zone 7A gardening. Um, and so I, I did think, you know, Reddit is actually one of the most accessible places. Our, the way we view it is Reddit is an open platform. It's one of our core um, principles is this idea of open by default. So we do not require you to log in to get access to the information that you might find in answer to a question in search or you know about parenting or gardening, et cetera. We believe that that's really important that every person be able to access this information. And so that I think really helps us be accessible because you can find your way things on Reddit without friction. And we designed it to, to be that way. Um, I think that's part of our, our mission. And it's actually what helps um, Reddit grow is that openness and the ability to, to, to do that. The second principle that we have is like empowerment. So everything on our platform is that is amazing is built by users. So the product itself is very simple. What's complicated are the thoughts and ideas and the th things that all of our users do that they, they, they bring to the table in terms of the the conversation and we empower them to build to moderate their communities to found communities and propel them and 
right. you know, everything on Reddit that's amazing is built by our users. And I think that also um, has made our platform, you know, more accessible uh, because it's simple, it's led with interest, there's no PII friction, and because it's 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 pretty empowering. It's organized by what you know, and you know you're surrounded by people who have similar interests. Uh, one thing that I have liked about the internet since I first logged in in 1994, I think, <laughs> with my old my old school modem, uh, has been the fact that there is a democratization. There's that ability to communicate around the planet. One of the first conversations I had in 1994 was uh, from a guy my age in Turkey, and we were talking about a band called the Stone Roses. I thought this is incredible that you can communicate on. On this scale, obviously, we've come a long way since then. Uh, CBK, I want to throw this one to you in terms of that idea of democratization of technology, or bringing everybody along. I mean, from HCL Technologies' uh, perspective, how do you how do you ensure that? How do you, how do you help that we grow this future that we all hope is going to come to pass? Oh, and Greg, I think uh, we are what we are witnessing is probably the most intense uh, digital proliferation of uh, technology into the business world. So every industry is getting techified, whether it is healthcare, whether it is retail, fintech, and even, I mean, very traditional industries in the industrial segment, manufacturing, all of them are trying to reinvent their uh, operating model, uh, emanating from the business model, uh, which is changing. Right, everyone is really focused on uh, how can they reimagine their business in a completely a virtual world, right? While a lot of them did a pivot to kind of survive and thrive through the pandemic, uh, but now they're resetting it to see what are those fundamental changes that they need to do uh, to, to kind of really thrive uh, in this kind of uh, you know, virtual world. And I think that offers so much of opportunities uh, for uh, for technology professionals to really create value uh, for their clients. And that's where we are bringing in a lot of industry knowledge and merging that with the technology capabilities uh, so that every industry focused team can kind of be very, very adept and in implementing the right solutions for our clients. We're going to throw things to a Q&A with the audience in a couple minutes' time. So I have one last question for the panel. I like setting these up as speed rounds. I mean, you don't have to answer in 10 seconds or less. But <laughs> I'll start with Aaron. And I asked this a lot of the guests to come on and be in a bloomer because we came out the other side of this thing. What's your one big takeaway from the pandemic that you say, okay, by no means did I enjoy having to live this way, but I take this lesson with me and go forward. We'll start with Aaron. Well, I think a uh, topical to this conversation here uh, in the pandemic, we've learned that um, technology plays both a role in utility in helping us through these types of times and also a role in giving us purpose and productivity in new and different ways. Uh, and my takeaway is that uh, I can do more than I thought I could. <laughs> Apparently I can work full time uh, and have three kids at home. And I believe there's a degree of both hardship and empowerment um, that has come uh, with this journey for most people, certainly here in Canada. Um, thanks to the great uh, support we've had uh, from our city, thanks to technology, I've learned um, that, that technology gives us the ability to do a lot and, and, and be capable of more than we thought. Hardship and empowerment. I like that. I might even uh, lift that on the TV show, although giving you full credit, of course, Aaron. Uh, uh, Sabrina, what are your thoughts on this? Well, first of all, I think technology is a tool that can be incredibly helpful. And secondly, I think it's resilience. I think Canadians, people around the world, we have been resilient. Um, we've always thought about resiliency at an individual level in our own personal struggles, but it's been interesting to see also the business resilience of being able to completely retool how you work from you know a front end user experience all the way down to supply chain and operate in a very different fashion. And I think those two things coupled together are a recipe for a lot of amazing innovation and growth to come. Jen, going to put it to you as well. The big takeaway from the pandemic. I would have said empowerment as well, but I'll, I'll say another one, which is I think the importance of belonging. Um, I think in a, in a moment where there was a lot of physical um, disconnection, um, what we saw, and I think is just, and I love seeing this, is people using technology to overcome that physical dislocation to get comfort and belonging by finding a way, you know, finding help, finding a way to 
be a better parent, learn how to cook, build a garden, find a new job, but finding other people that gave them comfort and emotional joy during a time when they might have been isolated at home. And I think we that really emphasize the importance of it. Oh, yeah, definitely. That connection to the outside world helped a lot of us, including me. Uh, and it was all made possible with technology. CVK, you'll get the last word on this before we throw it up for Q&A. Big takeaway from the pandemic. How does it help you propel your business forward? Uh, I think uh, technology coupled with the human ingenuity are the new essentials in today's world. I think just bringing these two pieces together really amplifies the power of resilience and power of uh, uh, technology and human ingenuity, they become the new essentials. That would be the biggest takeaway for us. All right. I, I really enjoyed that discussion. Those are my questions. I've hogged up enough of the time. Uh, Stephen, I believe you're going to start uh, taking some questions from the uh, from the viewers of the participants. Greg, thanks so much. Uh, great panel. So much to take away. Uh, I'm going to highlight a couple of things, and I'm sure I missed a lot, but technology is everywhere. Every business is a technology business. Tech habits will stick after the pandemic. I think I heard Sabrina's 92-year-old dad might be a YouTube star. But Toronto has uh, great, great, great tech talent. Work from home is here to stay. Flexible work is here to stay. But social interaction is really still important. So um, lots of great takeaways. Uh, we're going to turn to some questions in a second. But let me start off by asking one. Um, as I look on the screen, I see three of our uh, technology leaders are women in technology and are really role models um, for a lot of young girls, a lot of young women. Let me ask the question to all of you, how do we keep that trend going? How do we encourage more women to get into technology? I'll turn that back to you guys. Well, okay, I'll, I'll start because I'm, again, super passionate about this. Um, I, I think it's really important to start young. Um, Kumal, one of the engineers on our team, just did her second book on the uh, series called um, Era the Engineer. Uh, so that's just hit the book shops this week. And I think talking to your kids that, again, technology is just a tool. And if you want to be creative, if you want to be, uh, you know, in business, if you want to be a doctor, if you want to do anything, these, this is just an amazing thing to do. And I think what's really interesting about the past year, I'm the mother of, you know, two young kids, is that they are just so savvy. Like they were teaching me Google command key shortcuts on, on Google Classroom. They're all learning, you know, how to code in Canada. We're very fortunate to have that in the Ontario curriculum now. So I think it's just showing them the possibilities, showing them the role models is really, really important because people need to see uh, that it looks like them. And I also think it's really important that parents encourage uh, girls and underrepresented, uh, you know, youth of all type to really, really kind of lean into this. And I think further on in the career, if, if you haven't started young, you don't need to be afraid because this is learnable. I keep going back to these uh, reskilling stories of people that I've met with that have no digital skills, that worked in restaurants or did other uh, work before the pandemic and now are in digital jobs. So there's a lot of great micro-credentials like Grow with Google and beyond. Uh, so just try it out and see if you like it. Stephen, I might add something, um, just, just if possible, building on what Sabrina said, uh, which is that uh, it starts with, with education and then it starts with uh, all of the business leaders uh, clearly here on the panel and on the phone. Uh, you know, we're hiring uh, 50 people here in Toronto uh, and more and growing rapidly in the world. And, and there's such an important base of evidence that suggests it's, it's when, when women first enter their career, it's so important they get the leg up then. And so we share a very serious responsibility to give women access to, to jobs and opportunity uh, after uh, they graduate. Uh, and, and on that responsibility is one we all have to take very seriously because many of us are fortunate to be hiring and we're so excited. And I often partner with people like Sabrina to figure out how we lift more women up with us. Yeah, I would echo that as a, as a company that um, has been fortunate to be growing and, you know, doubling in size, like adding, you know, when you, add, when you have the opportunity to add 700 new people to a company, that is an incredible opportunity to create opportunities for women and diverse leaders to join your company. And um, we've spent a lot of time, in the, in, and in one year, you can change the composition of your company and 
create opportunities that are incredible because you're going through this this growth phase. So there's both opportunities within the business and an opportunity to bring people in. And that's something that we've really focused in on as a leadership team, such that in you know in a short order, um, we have uh, the, our workforce looks very different, which is really really exciting. So I encourage folks to take advantage of those opportunities to um, to create opportunities for women and other diverse up and coming leaders. Great. CVK, anything to add on that? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, we have such a wonderful and very, very successful women on this panel. It's really amplifying the stories and narratives of these leaders and similar people across the globe, uh, which is going to encourage more and more uh, young women to come into tech workforce and really take on the challenges and be very, very successful. And at HCL, we have a program called Fem Inspiration, where we invite women leaders to talk to a lot of young uh, young colleagues who are just starting their career. And that's been such a successful program that uh, people really love to kind of participate and create enduring connections with some of these successful women leaders. Uh, it just builds upon itself. Thank you so much. We're gonna turn to Taylor um, to see if we have some questions from the audience and uh, from media. Taylor. Thank you. Uh, we have some questions from our audience. The first one is, what are some of the steps that tech firms are taking to alleviate burnout caused by working from home? Anybody want to jump in? I don't think we heard the Can question. Can you repeat the question, Taylor? Oh, um, so one of the questions from our audience was, what are some of the- We can barely hear- uh... If we don't have the audio feed, Stephen? Okay, one second. Yeah. Okay, try that now. Taylor, try that again. Can you hear me now? Thumbs up? Yes. Okay. Okay, great. Um, so we have a question from our audience. What are some of the steps that tech firms are taking to alleviate burnout caused by working from home? Yeah, I, I, would, um, I could start. Um, this is this has been a, a, a something we've been thinking about. I mean, since the beginning of the pandemic, it's really been tough on everybody. As as a, as a mom with two kids, one of whom is screaming in the background here, like it, it is, it is really tough for on so many people for different reasons. Um, part of it was, you know was this this feeling of belonging and connectivity that where people were struggling and um, and we have we, we do a lot more really fun company events to create connectivity especially for new people who really haven't ramped and haven't met anybody and actually it's been really effective using zoom because you can you know unlike if we had gathered as a company and you sort of randomly meet people you know, uh, you know, as you walk around, you can actually construct a room of all new people, give them an agenda of, of, of things to talk about that are, that are really deep sharing. And they feel like they've got eight to 10 new people that they know that they, that they know in a really, you construct the interaction well in, in a great way. And you do that four or five times, there's suddenly a hundred people that they feel, that they feel connected to. Um, so we've been doing that quite a bit as well as more. Um, company meetings. The other thing we've done is we do a coordinated mental wellness day every month. We've been doing this since the beginning of the pandemic. Whole company takes the day off. There really should be little to no emails flying that day, and that is true. And our company has really said, wow, I mean, just that one day where the email volume's low, the, you know, the, just the work volume's low, take a breather. It yeah, feels so good, <laughs> um, and that's work. I think our our employees have um, really uh, really benefited from that. Um, but it is, you know, it is a re it has been a real real challenge um, when you're you know roll out of bed and roll to your desk and roll to your dinner table, and um, it's it's been a real challenge that's been expressed by by our our employees. Okay, Taylor, I think we've got a few more questions maybe. Yes, uh, so another question from our audience. How will tech companies remain relevant employers of talent 
amidst increasing automation and the inclusion of artificial intelligence? I think I'll, I'll jump in on that one because I think this is another misnomer one because they talk about 40% of, of jobs being automated or lost to automation. It's actually not jobs, it's of work. Uh, so 40% of work is going to be automated is one of you know the estimates and we don't know exactly what it will be in. What that means is that every job is going to have an element of automation that you're going to work alongside. And I see this with my team and the work that we do because we're a builder of some of this automation is what it means for the worker is interestingly, you're, you're dropping certain tasks that you've done in the past. And sometimes these are more repetitive tasks or things that can be done by machines and machine learning. And then the onus is to really up-level your skills in new areas on teamwork, uh, critical th thinking, driving strategy, doing things. So it, in kind of a reverse way, in, in that scenario, it is actually a very exciting thing uh, for someone with this continuous learner curiosity mindset, because your job is never the same. I've been at Google for 15 years. Before this job, I have never had a job that someone has done before me. And every single year, my job is different. And, and I find that exciting and enriching. Um, now, this is going to hit different sectors differently. But again, I think this ability to learn digital skills is so inherent in all of us. And uh, I, th I think there's actually a, a silver lining to all of this on the future of work. Anybody else want to pipe in? Yeah, I mean, I would uh, completely agree with Sabrina. Uh, it's, it's completely a misnomer that uh, so many jobs get eliminated. I think the tasks get automated but higher order jobs get created all the time. And we've seen that across many, many different life cycles of automation uh, in the last many years. And I think the whole lifelong learning, continuous learning, I think we need to emphasize that to alleviate such concerns about uh, large scale uh, uh, reduction in jobs and things like that. Okay, I think we're ready. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Aaron, Sabrina, Jen, CVK, Greg, thanks for moderating this panel. Uh, terrific, fantastic. Uh, uh, it's exciting, the future of technology and the role it will play and the role you as leaders will play. So again, thanks so much for joining us. Now we're gonna go to a video, uh, Mayor Patrick Brown of Brampton. is gonna share a few words with us. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're so fortunate in this region to have such great, great leadership throughout the region. And Mayor Brown has been uh, driving for us in Brampton through this pandemic and also driving economic growth. So over to Mayor Brown. Good morning, I am pleased to be here today to share with you the City of Brampton's story as it relates to the COVID-19 pandemic, our recovery, and how we continue to demonstrate economic resiliency. Brampton is the second fastest growing city in Canada and is on the verge of significant and deliberate transformation. Despite the COVID-19 pandemic, we continue to be energized with new knowledge and inspired by a new, uh, by a new way of thinking. Brampton's population is close to 800,000 people, and diversity is woven into every aspect of our way of life, whether it's food, art, business, and investment. We value and celebrate our diversity. Brampton truly is a mosaic, represented by young, diverse, uh, a young, diverse workforce, 234 cultures, speaking 115 languages. This is significant. It makes us a unique location in comparison to neighboring cities. 50% of new immigrants in Brampton are under the age of 24. We are one of the youngest cities in North America with a median age of 36.4 years old. One of our greatest logistical advantages for Brampton is our connectivity and market access. We are proudly home to the CN Intermodal, Canada's largest intermodal terminal, and to the closest downtown, the closest downtown to Pearson International Airport. Brampton has a large supply of vacant land still available, which is unique in the GTA. And we've got a diversified economy. This has proven vital during the recent COVID-19 pandemic. 
Our economy has shown great resiliency, especially in the areas of advanced manufacturing and food and beverage processing. We saw Brampton's advanced manufacturing companies pivot from producing their traditional products to the highly in-demand PPE equipment and sanitization supplies. We watched our food and beverage processors respond to higher than ever demand for their products and services, and they rose to the challenge by adhering to new health and safety guidelines while continuing to meet increased need and demand for their products. It really was incredible. In effort to support our business community and the residents of Brampton, we were one of the first cities in Canada to release an economic recovery strategy. Our strategy aims to bring resiliency and a competitive advantage to the Brampton economy. This is being achieved by fully adopting our innovation and technology transformation, seizing opportunities to attract investment, expediting infrastructure projects, and shifting the paradigm through which the arts and creative sector serves as the beating heart of Brampton. Our economic recovery strategy is organized into four cornerstones, innovation technology and entrepreneurship, the innovation and technology sector, uh, continues to be a highly adaptable and resilient. A significant focus is being put on supporting innovation and tech companies through dedicated sector supports as well as investments in the up-and-coming Brampton Innovation District, a key initiative under the innovation cornerstone. Being at the center of Canada's innovation corridor gives us the advantage of attracting talent from both Toronto and Waterloo, and we are actively inviting international businesses, globally minded startups and entrepreneurs to come to Brampton and be part of our new innovation district. For potential employers and startups, the Brampton Innovation District provides local talent development and support for entrepreneurs and new business owners through every stage of their journey, from education, training, and reskilling to support for companies of all sizes and across all sectors. The Innovation District is developing an ecosystem which, is, which also offers resources to support innovation and technology companies in creating new technology. It's an exciting addition to our Brampton downtown. Infrastructure. Historically, governments have launched infrastructure projects to help create jobs and drive economic recovery. Coming out of our economic crisis, as Canada's federal and provincial governments roll out infrastructure projects uh, to help the country come out of COVID, we are at the heart of that. We are uh, ready to take advantage of that economic impact. We have shovel-ready projects left, right and centre in Brampton. Arts, culture, and tourism is another component of our economic recovery. And right now, Brampton's identity not only remains relevant, but are required in an effort to transform the city's current cultural environment into a thriving art scene, um, complete with opportunities to produce, participate, and consume creative products that drive cultural and community progress, grow the local economy, attract investment, and build Brampton's identity. We're big believers that arts, investments in arts and culture, are our economic drivers. I'd also add the new normal that is being created throughout the economy post-COVID will provide opportunities as companies review and potentially restructure their operations and supply chains. The City of Brampton will seize these private sector investment opportunities by supporting our local companies as they adapt to new realities, building on our strategic advantages like logistics and looking internationally for companies that would benefit from investing in Brampton, an entry point into the North American market. In response to COVID-19, our FDI strategy pivoted to being completely virtual in 2020, something different for sure, and Brampton was one of the first cities in the country to host virtual FDI missions. The first missions were to Japan and Germany, and we had CEOs and companies who were grateful and receptive to be part of it. And I want to thank uh, uh, high commissions and embassies in other countries that worked with the city of Brampton to tell our story and, and tell how Brampton remained open for business despite the adversity of the pandemic. 
You know, Brampton is a great city to live, work, play, and invest. And I should note that some of the accomplishments we've seen I I with FDI are the FDI Intelligence, a division of the Financial Times UK, announced the results of its American Cities of the Year awards, with the city of Brampton actually ranking six in the top 10 mid-size North American cities of the future category. Brampton also ranked second in the top 10 mid-size American cities of the future connectivity category, and 12th in the top 20 25 American cities for FDI strategy. So it's nice to see Brampton's foreign direct investment being recognized. And, and you know, it is key. Um, it's key to our health sciences uh, expansion, advanced manufacturing, which includes, of course, food and beverage manufacturing. And, and it's also going to be key to our innovation and technology sector. Brampton received top honors with a first place ranking for the second consecutive year in the food processing leaders category category in the Business Facilities Magazine Annual Metro Rankings Report. And finally, McLean's Magazine has ranked Brampton among the top 15 Canadian cities to live in its Canada's Best Communities 2021 edition. And so these are rankings by prestigious um, institutions that highlight Brampton is a community of involvement, it's a community of amenities, it's a, it's a community of internet con con connectivity, making Brampton one of the top places to live, work and play in Canada. What I have shared today is just a glimpse into Brampton's story, uh, a, a story of diversity, connectivity, and economic resiliency. Through our economic recovery efforts, I know Brampton is building back stronger than ever, and we hope you can be part of it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mayor Brown, for joining us. Uh, amazing things happening in Brampton, as you said. Coming back stronger than ever. The sudden disruption and closure of the global, global economy caused by the pandemic has created fault lines and cracks. Fault lines where cracks once existed, uprooting daily practices, interactions, and the way we work. But it also gave leaders a chance to reimagine ways to, re to rebuild a more united, connected economy and region. So what have, what have we learned through all this? How do we ensure an equal recovery for all? And what are our priorities? Let's turn to a great panel we have lined up. Jan De Silva is the President and CEO of the Toronto Region Board of Trade, one of the largest and most influential business organizations in North America. She is spearheading efforts to make Toronto one of the most competitive and sought after business regions in the world. Kathleen McLaughlin is Executive Vice President and Chief Sustainability Officer for Walmart and President of the Walmart Foundation. Kathleen is responsible for programs that help Walmart create economic opportunity through jobs and sourcing, enhance the sustainability of supply chains and strengthen the resilience of local communities. On video we have Ravi Kumar, the president of Infosys. In his role, Ravi leads the Infosys Global Services Organization across all global industry segments, driving all of Infosys's digital transformation services. Mike Appleson, Arrivals Automotive, Automotive Chief Executive Officer, he joined in October 2019 to support Arrivals in its mission to revolutionize the auto industry. Mike leads Arrival Automotive in both North America and Europe and holds a leadership role within Arrival R&D. Let me please welcome Rita Tritcher, senior business writer and columnist for the Globe and Mail's Report on Business to moderate this panel. Rita, over to you. with the Globe and Mail. And we have an excellent discussion uh, lined up for you today. 
Uh, before we plunge into my questions, and of course I have lots of questions as a journalist, um, I'm going to give the floor to each of the speakers to give introductory remarks. They're going to just speak for a few minutes each to kind of give her an overview of what, where they're coming from. And we're going to start with Jan. So Jan, take it away. Sure. Um, happy to be here today to have a discussion about how we're going to come back better and stronger. But it all starts with the fact that what we've got here in the region is a very strong business community. And since the start of the pandemic, large employers, building owners, small employers, innovators have all come together to look at the problems we're facing, the solutions that we could find globally and locally, and to put them into practice. So very delighted to continue the discussion uh, with my fellow panelists. And I'll hand it back to you. Okay, Kathleen, want to hear from you next. Great. Well, it's wonderful to be here with you today. Thank you so much. Um, I am the Chief Sustainability Officer for Walmart, and I happen to be based in the global headquarters in Arkansas, but confession, I'm a newcomer to Canada as of 20 years ago, <laughs> married a Canadian husband, have three Canadian kids. I spend an awful lot of time in Toronto. And Canada is really important uh, for Walmart. And you know, I think one of the things I can bring to this conversation is the role of business in helping us build back stronger than ever yeah. here in the Toronto region, in Ontario and Canada in general. Um, we take very much a shared value approach to business at Walmart. And what that means is we are really, the success of our business depends on our ability to serve obviously not only our customers, and wow, this pandemic has presented such huge challenges in that regard that I'm sure we'll get into. But also our stakeholders, our associates, we're 100,000 strong in Canada, Toronto is our headquarters region. Uh, so the opportunities we can provide through employment, advancement opportunities and so on. Suppliers, you know, we've invested about $17.5 billion in the last year alone in suppliers based in Ontario. You know, it's about um, 1,400 suppliers suppliers and about half of that is food and food companies so the role we can play in driving economic development and growth for so many other companies that provide employment and services to their customers and then of course in the broader community and we'll, we'll talk about that and, and we know that to be successful as a company we need to serve all of our stakeholders well we call that shared value and it's a really important part in this next era as we you know are still struggling with the pandemic and come through it how can we contribute our assets in a way that really serves stakeholders and strengthen um, lives for stakeholders in general? That's great. Uh, Ravi, I'm gonna call on you next to give some introductory remarks. Thank you, Rita. Thank you for the opportunity to be a part of this wonderful panel. Uh, Infosys uh, has been on an exciting journey in Canada. We have 2,000 plus employees and we're doubling our workforce in the next two years. One of the most exciting things about Infosys is we hire from schools and colleges and big feeders of talent. That's the future. Uh, we do believe that the future of enterprises is going to be about lifelong learning, and uh, we weave it with the academic ecosystems, policymakers, and big feeders of talent for digital transformation journeys. We are going to leverage Canada not just for Canadian clients. We want to make that a hub for North American clients. And ironically, this health crisis has given us this chance to virtualize work and uh, create talent in a, in a way that it can actually cater to any part of the way. Uh, interestingly, uh, my clients at Infosys have started to believe that uh, we could reset the future of work, workplaces, and workforce and make it much more inclusive, much more diverse, and a very purposeful future. So the assumptions of the past, the hypothesis of the past can be challenged, and we could, uh, ironically, in a, in a way, you know, the health crisis has given us this chance to reset for a much better purpose. Great, thank you so much. And last but not least, certainly not least, Mike, we'd like to get your opening thoughts. Well, thanks very much, Rita, and I very much appreciate the opportunity to participate on this panel on such an important subject. I want to talk a little bit about Arrival because I suspect many people in the audience haven't heard of us yet. Um, we are a public company, and our focus is zero emission commercial vehicles. Um, now, electric vehicles are certainly a popular subject nowadays, but Arrival was actually founded six years ago, and in that time, We've been working on unique and, and uh, very different ways to manufacture class-leading electric commercial vehicles. Our first two products 
that will both go into production next year are a last mile delivery van, as well as a transit bus. And one of the uh, intents of the company is to work with cities uh, like Toronto and the Toronto region on how to completely reimagine public transportation in a way that is more equitable, in a way that is zero emission, in a way that it is diverse. And I think although the pandemic has obviously had some very negative impacts, uh, it also then presents some opportunities as we come out the other side of it to rethink how we want to uh, reimagine cities going forward, uh, given what we've learned over the past 18 months. So again, very much a pleasure to be here. Well, thank you all for being here. Let's jump right into the discussion. We're in the fourth wave of this pandemic now here in Canada. What are the big lessons for the business community? And are businesses actually prepared for this next leg of the crisis? I want to hear from all of you on this question. Uh, and we're going to go in this order. Jen, uh, Kathleen, Ravi, and then Michael. So, Jen, take it away. Sure. Great question. I can tell you the big learning we've had from the pandemic is understanding how our economy operates and how our business districts are focused. Uh, for instance, Kathleen's organization, Walmart, is in an area we call the Pearson Logistics Zone. This is Walmart, Canada Post, Amazon, a lot of distribution uh, activity related to e-commerce. The pandemic has hit them very differently than it's hit downtown Toronto, which is a metropolitan center, where 67% of our workforce were able to work from home. In the Pearson zone, uh, it's the opposite. 67% of staff had to be physically present. So there's been a lot of lessons learned about how to safely allow that workforce to operate so that those that are working from home can still access goods and how we can transfer those learnings into the downtown core as we're now preparing for reopening there. Yes. Well, you know, the, the pandemic in many ways accelerated some of the trends that we were experiencing, you know, before 2020 in terms of customer preferences for e-commerce, omni-channel solutions and so on. And of course, the pandemic's just accelerated all of that. So for us, our first priority was our own people. Could we continue to operate and meet the needs of our customers while protecting uh, associates? So we invested $125 million in incremental paid time off for people who needed to stay home in quarantine or you know, obviously people who got sick. Um, and then also so telehealth options and other assistance, so mental health services and, and, and so on. PPE and changes to our operating procedures to provide protection for associates and for customers to shop with distancing, metering, and so on. Um, so all of those kinds of things to say, well, could we continue to operate in that environment? And then if people didn't need to be physically present to conduct their work, to your point, Shan, you know, remote options and how can we use digital technologies to enable remote work, which we think that will be a feature for many people, you know, going forward, even, even hopefully as we come through the pandemic. Um, so that's point one. Point two, we massively accelerated our transition to an omni-channel company. So by the end of this year, 100% of our stores will offer online grocery pickup. And that's a service that you know, was, was not the majority of our stores before the pandemic because people want to be able to shop in different ways and we're trying to meet that need. Obviously throughout the pandemic in different stages, the role that we could play in providing access to affordable food and other essentials, you know, that's, that's been really important. And then as I was saying earlier, this um, desire to then use our assets to go beyond to support other stakeholders in ways that also strengthen our business. So our supplier relationships, you know, continuing to invest and provide opportunities for suppliers to access customers and grow their businesses. Um, and then beyond that in communities, you know, through the pandemic, we actually announced a three and a half billion dollar infrastructure investment. Much of that will be in Ontario, a new distribution center in Vaughan, reconstruction or refurbishment of about a third of our store fleet. That's money that's going to work in local communities here in the region, you know, and beyond. Um, and then more broadly, you know, Rita, as we get into the conversation, other things that we're trying to do to advance community resilience, community cohesion, using our assets. So um, opportunities around inclusion and equity for our customer communities and associate communities and so on. Right. Ravi. Oh, 
Oh, Ravi, you're on mute. Those are wonderful comments from both the panelists. Um, so I'm going to add a few additional things which uh, I see at Infosys as well as uh, our clients. Um, so first of all, we never realized that we are in such an interdependent and interconnected way that uh, everyone is weaved on a digital fabric uh, and we're not isolated to everything happening around us. We've never felt like that ever before. All of the digital infrastructure we invested on over the years allowed us to become first digital responders to first responders uh, uh, in enterprises who we cater to. Our associates went 100% on our remote, but we were able to um, deliver to our client needs and be those first digital responders because of the investments we made on digital infrastructure ourselves. Uh, even before we uh, uh, we help our clients to build that digital uh, digital infrastructure as a partner, uh, there are a few things which are kind of uh, really are big lessons which we have learned uh, looking at our business and looking at our business of our clients. First of all, uh, the pivot to every business has to balance between resilience and agility. The clock speed was at, at an extraordinary uh, high. And how do you deal with uh, live sentience uh, and respond to uh, needs in the market? Uh, there will be a permanent shift to hybrid work. Um, I think we, we went through an easy phase of taking everybody remote. That was e easier from going from all physical to all remote. Mm -hmm. The world we will all get into in a post-pandemic era is going to be hybrid, which is going to be between physical and virtual and you're going to toggle between the two, that's going to be harder to do in comparison to doing all remote. Um, we are going to move into a rapid digitization. Every industry is going to become a software industry. Software is going to be the new alchemy. Um, software will drive efficiency, productivity in every industry. And while digitization was happening even before the pandemic hit, there is rapid acceleration of digitization in every part of the business and every industry. And added to digitization, there's going to be great dispersion, dispersion of business models, dispersion into homes of people, you know, unlocking businesses from physical workplaces to a hybrid model. The role of businesses having a much bigger purpose has never been felt like it was felt now. Businesses are the biggest platforms for societal change. I think every business has started to acknowledge in some sense that the businesses are those platforms which can drive that societal impact and change. Uh, empathy at workplace has never been more important than, than it is today. And finally, I would like to conclude by saying one other thing. The need of social capital in workplaces and the constituents of your ecosystem, I think is a very critical part of being successful and actually being impactful in the future. The need to build social capital. Those are some great, great insights. Uh, Mike, what do you have to add? So um, a, a few things here uh, in addition to comments made so far. There's a saying in business, don't waste a crisis. And I think the, the meaning of that is a crisis like the health crisis we've been through over the past 18 months forced all of us to figure out new ways to do things or how to do things more quickly than we might otherwise have done them. And so, you know, if two years ago you'd asked me whether we could effectively run a rival basically as a completely remote organization, I think I would have been a little skeptical. Whereas now I've seen us do it for 18 months. I think the challenge as uh, Ravi referenced, um, I don't believe that uh, we're gonna be running entirely remotely going forward. Uh, certainly, as a very high-growth company that's hiring a lot of employees, we find it's quite difficult to build the culture uh, or the strength of the company culture that's so important to us when everybody's operating remotely. There's got to be some amount of people sharing experiences in the same physical space. And, and so I agree. I think a hybrid work experience going forward is, uh, is going to be um, the way we operate. On a completely different, uh, or from a completely different direction, I would tell you as we've watched um, the various struggles with global supply chains, it's given us at Arrival 
a lot of confidence in the way that we're looking at manufacturing vehicles. We are looking at a distributed manufacturing approach utilizing what we call microfactories. The idea being that each microfactory um, services a regional or even a large metropolitan area and supplies vehicles for that uh, region, sourcing as much as we can from that local region. And so moving towards as local a supply chain as, and as local a manufacturing footprint as we can get to. And I think this idea of manufacturing zero emission vehicles for use in your local community um, is extremely attractive and uh, a great way to empower uh, the carbon emission reduction in commercial vehicles. That's a great point that you make about supply chains and how they're going to uh, shift going forward, uh, making them more local. You've given me a great column idea, Mike. Thank you for that, uh, very selfishly. Okay, let's talk a bit about workplace transformation in more detail. You know, from each of your perspectives, what are some of the issues that should be top of mind for business leaders? And Kathleen, I want you to start this one. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, we've already mentioned a number, a number of them so far. Um, for business leaders to create a very inclusive, welcoming environment that helps people advance in their careers, that's a real focus for us. During the pandemic, in some ways, we were able to provide an employment lifeline or a bridging opportunity for many people. We hired about 20,000 people um, you know, last year uh, at the height of the pandemic. So obviously, providing employment is one. But as importantly then, investing in people to acquire the skills that they would like to gain to move into the next stage of their careers. And of course, in an omni-channel retail operation like Walmart, there's so many different career paths. There's retail management, supply chain management, but there's also technology, healthcare, transportation, and so on. So we're investing substantially in programs like Walmart Academy to upskill people on the job so that they can be earning while they're learning, getting credentials that mean something and help them move to that next stage, whether it's at Walmart or in another opportunity. Third, there's a tremendous opportunity to be a springboard for inclusion in society through employment. Walmart is a place of newcomers. You know, you look at our customer base, our associate base, we really reflect Canadian society in that way. Last year, we uh, were recognized as a top employer for inclusion and uh, diversity, and that's something that we prioritize. So, you know, for example, over half of our workforce um, is made up of women, and about an equal amount of the promotions go to women. So we're really trying to see that pipeline of management and executives you know, we can look at the same thing in terms of people of color. Globally, our officer team is over 30% women. Um, and in terms of people of color, about the same percentage. So this is something that we're really, really prioritizing. And then it's so important to our associates, and I think this is true of many employers, people care about their role in terms of purpose. You know, people's inner lives matter. Why do you come to work every day? So helping associates uh, connect to all the ways that they can achieve a broader purpose that goes even beyond their professional development. So I talked about the shared value philosophy, but helping people engage in initiatives that use our business assets to address issues in society, whether that is environmental sustainability or equity, opportunity issues, community cohesion, and so on. And in terms of workplace specifically, one of the examples where our internal work around equity and inclusion is very much connected to then how we use our assets to strengthen equity and inclusion in society is, is this arena of workforce development and education, but beyond that, um, health care and addressing inequities in society around access to health for black and indigenous communities, uh, and then also financial. Uh, stability and, and outcomes in terms of wealth creation. So a real focus on supplier diversity and inclusion programs to attract and support black-owned suppliers or indigenous-owned suppliers, women-owned businesses, and so on. So there are multiple ways that our associates and teams are taking their day jobs, whether they're merchants or store operators or real estate people, and figuring out how do I apply those to actually serve the community more broadly in ways that also strengthen our business. Again, that shared value idea. So that sense of purpose and mission, that's 
you know, I'd say more important to people today than ever to feel that they've got an engaged and meaningful career. I absolutely agree, Ravi. Uh, you know, what is what are the issues that you see should be that should be top of mind for business leaders when we're thinking about workplace transformation? Sure, absolutely. You know, um, there is going to be a great reset in work workplaces and workforce. Um, Today, the workplace is built, evolved from the industrial revolution. The industrial revolution is when, you know, a template for work and workplace and workforce was established and then it evolved over the years. And in recent times, I would say there has been a change with digitization of workplaces. But right now, we're going to see a great reset. We've spoken about hybrid work. Uh, I'm going to touch upon a few things which, um, uh, which, which actually sounded very interesting to me. Um, the, the concept of not having a headquarter for a workplace, I think, is going to be real. We already see listings in the stock markets with no headquarters. Uh, we're going to switch significantly to network structures versus hierarchical structures, which came from the Industrial Revolution. Uh, um, agile distributed teams, in fact, the ones which had more agile distributed teams, actually were much more successful uh, in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, work and education are going to be intertwined. You know, the life of skills has become very short. It happened even before the health crisis happened with digitization, but the digitization, rapid digitization is going to reduce this life of skills. Work and education are going to be intertwined. So you're going to have well-being, learning, productivity, all a part of the workplace fabric. Um, you know, we are not. We are going to move away from an era where we studied and, were, and went to educational institutions for the first 20 plus years of our life, and then all our life we worked on jobs. We are going to go into a continuum of lifelong learning where work and education are going to be intertwined. Um, yet we have to now deal with equity and inclusivity between physical on-site teams and remote workers. I, I agree with Mike, we are never going to be fully remote, we are never going to be fully physical, we're going to be hybrid. But what happens if teams actually lean in more physical or lean in more virtual? And uh, would you be able to create the equity and inclusivity, inclusivity on it? How do you build rhythms in hybrid structures? We had a rhythm at work, that's why we went to physical workplaces. How do you build them on a virtual platform? How do you sustain social capital? Uh, you know, many companies have started to exhaust the social capital in a remote world. How do you sustain them? How do you transition from full-time workers to full-time workers plus part-time workers plus machines? Machines will do problem solving, and humans will be on an endeavor of problem finding, problem finding for a better purpose. So how do you get to that mix of machines taking over problem solving and humans taking over problem finding? Part-time workers are, are an integral part of uh, the fabric. I call it human plus gig plus machines. New productivity benchmarks and baselines. All the productivity benchmarks we had so far is out of the window. And finally, how do you build a confluence of work, workplace measures where well-being, learning, and productivity are all intertwined? I think these are very, very important considerations as we define the future, and I'll agree with uh, 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 panelists about uh, the role of inclusivity and diversity, we have a much better chance to, to solve it in a workplace than ever before. All right, Mike, what are the t uh, prime considerations as far as you're concerned? So uh, I just, I want to make a point about inclusivity and diversity. Um, certainly what we found in the company is uh, when everybody's remote, everybody's doing meetings through Zoom, it's a bit of a great leveling tool. Um, you know, we've all been in meetings where a few people in person dominate the conversation. And at least, you know, for us, and I suspect for many people, when everybody's on a completely equal footing, we're all remote and we all have to respect others' opportunity to voice their opinions, it, it, it really did change the dynamic in, uh, in meetings. And I think that's a specific example of this broader topic of we've seen more change in the last 18 months in the way most companies do work than we'd seen over the previous several decades, uh, to Ravi's point. And how is it now that we take these new methods of working together, the, the mix of digital, the mix of remote, the mix of in-person, and come up with a better, more inclusive way going forward to really get the best 
from every employee. And I, I think that's the real challenge for companies going forward. Okay, we're going to talk about uh, diversity and inclusion more in a second, but I, I do want to hear from Jan about what she thinks the uh, top priorities ought to be as workplaces make this transition. Look, I think my fellow panelists have covered tremendous ground. I think I would sum up what I'm hearing from them and what I'm hearing from our business community is the big leadership capability that's going to be required going forward is that ability to lead a hybrid organization. How do you stimulate belonging and connection among your workforce? As Mike said, some are working remotely, some are working uh, in person. So it's really going to be a critical skill that's going to be required for the future. The other piece I would add is that for those in a physical setting, what we've learned from the pandemic, it's not just what happens in your office, it's what happens in the business district where your office is located. So how do we make sure things like the transit networks and the food courts and the restaurants and everything else that are accessible to your workforce are safe and, um, and giving them a sense of confidence about returning to the office and to the workplace. So those would be the key things that I think about when I think about the transformation of the workplace. Excellent. All right. Now I want to talk about diversity and inclusion uh, and the opportunities in a hybrid workplace. I wrote a piece last week for the Globe and Mail that talked about how the hybrid workplace risks becoming the next career killer for women. It went absolutely uh, wild on social media. Lots of people were discussing it. We covered it in an episode of The Decibel, our podcast, this week. I want to hear from each of you how you're thinking about hybrid workplaces and creating these DNI opportunities. And I want to hear from Ravi first. Thank you, Lisa. You know, uh, there's never been a better time actually suited to resolve and solve our diversity and inclusivity issues in workplaces. Uh, there are some pitfalls we need to be watchful about. You spoke about one of them. The second is how do you create equity and inclusivity between remote and physical workers? Um, how do you make sure that hybrid work leads to more inclusive growth? You know, there is a statistic, at least in the United States, uh, which talks about how people who had uh, who were earning more than $70,000 a year actually got more opportunities during the pandemic than people who were actually having less than $70,000 a year. And that's because remote hybrid work has not been enabled for all constituents of the workplace. So we need to actually make, we need to be careful about pitfalls. The good news is, and the good news is much, much better than the bad news. The good news is work is going to move away from rich urban settings to dispersed models, virtualizing work, and therefore giving access to the farthest parts of the world and the farthest parts of uh, countries where work was not accessed. That is for real. Every client of mine tells me, I don't care where you want to work from, uh, where, you, where you employ people and where you hire people as long as you get it done. So that has never happened before. That has never happened before. And I think this is our opportunity to untangle work from physical, rich urban settings to dispersed models. Work is going to get disconnected from workplaces. Jobs are going to get disconnected from work, and work and jobs are going to get disconnected from workplace, which essentially means just the options to explore for enterprises are multiple, you know, umpteen number. And therefore, we have this unique opportunity to reset it. Um, you know, if somebody wants to do part-time work, frankly, gig workers were only in the ride-sharing economy. They were not really in corporate workplaces. But if work is modular because of digital platforms and it is virtualized, you could have part-time workers, which essentially means if somebody couldn't access work because they couldn't do it for eight hours a day, can actually access work. And they could access work not coming to cities, but be, be at their homes and access work. Machines taking over solving problems I spoke about will make sure that we have cognitive diversity in workplaces. We only had problem solvers in workplaces. We will now have people with much more cognitive diversity. Companies like Infosys hired STEM graduates for the last 35 years or so, 35 years or so. Now we are hiring liberal arts graduates, community college students, associate degree holders, no degree holders, because skills are so short. Why do you need a degree? So I think the fact that skills have a short life will give us an opportunity to pivot to skills and not on degrees. 
education was not a leveler for the world in the last few decades. Education actually created inequality because education was so expensive. Inflation went up in the last 20 years by 50%. Cost of education went up by 150%. So education as a lever will actually have to pivot to skills and not on degrees. All this combined, I would believe, cognitive diversity, part-time workers, more uh, access to virtualized work, uh, you know, more pivoting on skills and not on degrees is all going to be important confluence of forces, which will make diversity and inclusivity a natural ally in the, in the, in the workplace. Those are some great points, Kathleen. I know you talked about DNI already, but I wondered if you had anything to add to your previous comments. Yeah, I would just say a few things. I agree with what what, what Ravi has said about the broad trends, and I think it's pretty exciting to consider uh, the positive benefits of those trends. That said, I'd say a couple things. Um, first of all, uh, much work still remains physical, and certain occupations have more of that requirement to be in person. So. For example, if I'm an agronomist at Walmart, at some point I need to be in the tomato field, you know, working with the tomato farmer and looking at the produce and advising on sustainability and those sorts of things. Or if I'm a merchant, at some point I need to touch and feel the product and see what it looks like on the shelf. And so physically being there. And of course, if I'm somebody in the store, if I'm a pharmacist administering a vaccine or I'm, you know, helping run the, the, the cashier station, those are, you know, physical requirements that, um, will remain in many jobs. Uh, second, in terms of the ability to have some remote work and have hybrid teams and so on, I think our challenge is to balance the promise of flexibility and the capacity that gets freed up if people aren't driving into an office and driving home and that sort of thing with some of the things that you've alluded to, Rita, in terms of, okay, well then there is a premium put on your ability to set boundaries then about when does the work stop and home life begin, you know, as a mother and someone who's been juggling, like probably many people for the last couple of years, increased demands at home around meal preparation and taking care of the kids and keeping people's mental health <laughs> stable and so on, and trying to jump on the Zoom and do a meeting. You know, I work for a global company, so it would be tempting to get on the, you know, the Zoom with you know, people in India at midnight. And so, so how do you set boundaries as a person in the workforce and as a leader, how do you make it okay to set some boundaries? And then, um, you know, we believe at Walmart that physical community does remain important for the workforce. That is free to core people having some opportunity to be together physically in certain team settings. It's really important for the health of the team. So I think there's a lot to work through as we enter this you know, new era um, to harness the benefits of, of what technology enables, uh, but manage the risks and uh, manage the downsides. Okay, we only have five minutes before we have to get to audience questions, but I really do wanna hear from both Mike and Jan on this uh, question of diversity and inclusion. So take it away, Mike. So I'll try and be brief. Um, uh, because the other panelists, I think, have made excellent points. Um, I, diversity and inclusion, as always, has got to start at the top of the company. Um, uh, Kathleen made some points earlier about uh, large companies and, and efforts they need to go to to make sure people um, see diversity and inclusion around them. I, I, again, I keep going back to this new way of working, which I think is a great opportunity. I remember early in my career debates about flex hours and, you know, could you afford to let an employee not be in the office for X number of hours a week? I think, you know, we're all moved well past that now. And we need to think about how do we take advantage of all these things we've learned to uh, move diversity and inclusion along. Jen, you have anything to add? I think I'd like to take it in a little bit of a different direction, and that is, I agree with Ravi, I don't think there's ever been a better time for diversity and inclusion goals to be realized. And if I could share an example, I worked for many years in Asia, and I remember there'd be discussions there about gender equality and pay, and uh, business leaders would be saying, don't understand what you're talking about, there's such a shortage of talent, we're just paying the best prices we can to get the talent that we need. We don't even pay attention to gender, and I think that's our situation right now in Toronto, in the region, coming through the pandemic. There's been an explosion of great new jobs at Walmart, Amazon, others that have attracted 
folks that might have been working in restaurants or other venues. So now there's a shortage of jobs uh, or talent for those other jobs. You go downtown Toronto, there's help wanted signs everywhere. So I think we've got a tremendous moment in time where there's so much demand for talent that we've got opportunities for diversity inclusion, not just to be a stated goal, it's just going to naturally be realized because that's the talent pool we have to recruit from and we have a need for talent. Yeah. One, one other thing I might... I one other thing I might add, Rita, just it goes to Robbie's point and what you just made too. Um, digital tools really help in terms of skill acquisition. So a lot of things that would require people to physically go to night school in a place and learn, you know, people can do in different ways. And we're certainly as an employer, as many employers are doing, harnessing that to provide new skills and credentials to people that mean something for advancement. Um, so that people can learn on the job and bump up their skills in meaningful ways and progress. That's incredibly helpful for diverse populations to take down barriers to advancement uh, and even release some of the requirements around particular degrees or pedigrees and so on and focus more on skills and evidence of skills. And that's something that we're really investing in as an employer. I'm so excited to hear all of you talk about uh, this issue. It's something that uh, we've written about so much uh, at The Globe, and I know other journalists have as well, um, but it just seems to be uh, something that's actually picking up steam now, so it's very encouraging. Um, I appreciate all of your insights on that. Uh, we only have like a minute left before we have to go to audience questions, so I want to ask you to do a little bit of a speed round here, so maybe just a really brief thought from each of you on sustainability because that's another important topic. Where do we go from here? Uh, maybe just 10 seconds each. Mike, I'm gonna start with you. So Arrival is all about sustainability. Zero emission commercial vehicles, those vehicles that are used all day, every day in commercial tasks, those are the first ones you want to replace with zero emission vehicles to improve quality of life in cities. And then think about this idea of distributed manufacturing. We've talked about the carbon cost of farm to table I can make the same argument about supply chains and manufacturing. Uh, we need to move towards this idea of distributed manufacturing as a way to minimize the carbon footprint of our manufacturing. Okay, next up, let's hear from Kathleen. Yeah, I mean, we could talk for you know another hour about sustainability, but um, I'll just <laughs> say briefly, we're trying to uh, transform the way that retail works in general and product supply chains for regeneration, let alone sustainability. And by that, we mean getting to a net zero carbon future in our own operations and in supply chains. We were the first retailer to set and approve science-based target for emissions reduction, which is consistent with the one and a half degree scenario. And that involves transportation, Mike. So, you know, our long haul tractor trailers, we've ordered 130 of them from Tesla. They show up soon. So, you know, Mike, maybe we'll talk later, but if you guys want to get into that <laughs> end of the transportation business too. Um, but, you know, I'm it's everything. Board, Kathleen. Yeah, you know, it's renewable energy. And then supply chain, it's a big deal. We have um, 697 Canadian suppliers yep. engaged in our all out effort on climate. They're working on climate, reporting, disclosing, and you know, we could talk for an hour about that. Second, wait eliminating waste in operations obviously but also in supply chains food waste packaging waste you know again lots to say about that and then third nature you know we're now realizing how critically important natural ecosystems are and as a food retailer a lot of what we sell and that our customers enjoy goes back to some ecosystem a field a forest an ocean so how do we change the methods of production and tack on additional conservation restoration so that we can decouple consumption from preservation of our natural ecosystem. So it's a long, it's a big topic, but it's absolutely essential. And you know, I don't know of a business that isn't now considering in earnest, how do we get after this using the tools of business to really promote a sustainable future. So it's 121, I'm really sorry to do this, but we're gonna have to leave this discussion here. Um, it's an important topic as you point out, but I'm gonna have to throw it back to Stephen now because he wants to uh, take some questions from the participants and I, I think they wanna hear from you too. So Stephen? Rita, thanks so much, you really appreciate it. Uh, great panel everybody, I was trying to capture some of the key themes and uh, boy, you guys covered a lot. Um, <laughs> sustainability, diversity and inclusion, uh, zero emissions, don't waste a crisis, supply chains, <coughs> social capital, hybrid work, education. Um, you covered it all and you really delved into diversity, inclusion, and sustainability. So 
We really appreciate it. Um, let me ask a question that um, has been touched on but not delved into. And it's, uh, it's an area close to um, a lot of our hearts. Uh, this, this whole pandemic has had a significant impact on the mental health of people. Everybody from kids to executives to, to workers throughout the organizations. Uh, I just want to get some ideas from you guys of what you're seeing in your organizations. Uh, you all run companies and Jan, you have 13,500 members. So uh, it just seems to be an issue that it's exploded and I'd like to get your feedback. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you want to go first? Yeah. Yeah. No, uh, it's, a top, it's top of mind. Every conversation you have about workforce, about talent, about morale, um, everyone is uh, taking different approaches to try to get their arms around this. We heard from the previous panel there's that mental health day a month where everything just shuts down. We've tried something similar where with our workforce of 125, Tuesdays and Thursdays from 3 to 5, it's no meeting zone. And it's just their chance to catch up, get prepped, and it had a huge impact when we mm -hmm. introduced that. So absolutely, everyone is hugely sensitized to this. And yeah. I'll maybe yeah, turn it over I to would Kathleen. I echo that. I mean, on a personal note, I talked about some of my challenges. I have had, you know, periods during this pandemic personally where my mental health is definitely mm. in question and we see it all around we've all been reading about it and feeling it in our own communities at walmart we've had a five percent uptake in our mental health resources so we provided a, a variety of resources including a partnership with thrive which some of you may be familiar with there's been a noticeable uptake you know in that so um, I don't know that we've got solutions. We're experimenting with exactly the kind of thing you talked about yeah. in um, our own teams. We've done things like we took the week around Canada Day, 4th of July, and just said, you know what? That's flex week. No meetings. Do what you want. If you want to take paid time off, you can. Um, but if you're working, that's fine. But it's just a breather zone, and that was a really important you know, thing, similar to what you're talking about. We have meeting-free Wednesday afternoons. and. You know, I'm talking about, of course, people who are working in home office jobs. I think in the stores, we've tried to be really accommodating in terms of adding paid time off, providing mental health resources, being very flexible in terms of leave, you know, for people who just want to take a day. Um, and, and, you know, Ravi, I think it's a little bit like what you're talking about, learning to work in a hybrid mode. We, we also need to, there's mental health challenges that come with everything else going on, it's not just the pandemic, it's sustainability and racial equity challenges. We're feeling it all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, great feedback. Uh, Mike, uh, Ravi? You know, I think uh, the two panelists covered it very well. Uh, we have more resources on a workplace for mental health uh, than ever before. Um, deeply weaved into the workplace fabric now. It's an open conversation. Um, which never was as as open as it were, as it is today. Uh, so I would say this has got the most attention in most industries and most workplaces, and um, I agree with uh, uh, everything which has been said so far. Mike, any I think comments? on the one hand, remote work it becomes more challenging to judge your your colleagues' mental health, and and so we all need to be much more attuned to that. It's you know, if you're not in an office together and you can't have a casual conversation, um, I think companies have to put more effort in making sure that people understand their mental health is important. On the other hand, I think as everybody gets more comfortable with remote working, it also offers a way to make mental health resources available to people and people I think are more comfortable with that. Certainly we're using that um, inside of Arrival uh, throughout the pandemic and going forward. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. It's a great topic, and I appreciate all your response. Uh, I think we might have time for a question. Taylor, do we have any questions? Thank you. Yes, I do have a question from the audience. Uh, what qualities and skills will be most important to employers as they are looking for talent in the post-pandemic world? Yeah. Uh, I can take that. If, yeah, uh, go ahead, Ravi. I was going to yep. say, I think Ravi. All right. Work. So, you know, uh, <laughs> cross-functional skills because as you go hybrid you're in a little more a little bit of a self-serve mode um, i have spoken about lifelong learning this is one of my favorite topics um, you need to know how to learn to learn learn to unlearn and learn to relearn uh, and those virtuous cycles will happen all your life because the life of skills is so short in fact 
I actually think we need a Walmart Walmart Plus template uh, for, for education, uh, which is um, get recurring subscription education all your life. Um, so this whole concept of just in case learning, which we did, you know, first 25 years we learned just in case something is needed all our life. We will move from just in case learning to just in time learning deeply embedded into workplaces. So we need lifelong learners. Um, people who can work on managed by exception to micromanagement, because hybrid workplaces, um, you're kind of managing by exception. People who can work on network structures versus uh, uh, versus, hybrid, versus uh, hierarchical structures. Um, you know, we are a tech company we are hiring sociologists, anthropologists, psychologists, because the cognitive diversity needed at workplaces has changed significantly. Okay. Um, you know, technology has become so deeply embedded that it's very low code. You could, anybody who has an ability to apply technology can apply. So much more cognitive diversity in workplaces. Um, we have to start to prepare ourselves for a world where you want to do headless leadership in a way, like headless transformation. Um, you know, I, I, I don't even know where my headquarters is because um, organizations have become much more agile, distributed, and networked. Um, so that's how the world is shifting. In fact, if I have to draw a little, if I have to stretch a little bit, if we're going to have good workers in a workplace, uh, the traditional HR channels of acquiring, re, you know, engaging talent and retaining talent, that is all out of the window. Gig workers, you have to curate the talent, assimilate the talent and dismantle it and move on to the next cycle. Um, you know, I'm, strong, I'm a strong believer that the world is going to move from humans to humans plus gig plus machines. And how do you work alongside machines? Where machines do the problem solving humans amplify the potential. You know, machines amplify the potential of humans. Um, AI is going to take away jobs of the past, it's going to create jobs of the future. So how do you make sure that that learning actually creates a more prosperous workplace? So there are so many of these skills which will come into picture now. I, I, I'm really optimistic about how the future of workplaces is. It's going to be much more diverse and much more cognitively diverse. Uh, then the workplaces of today, which have actually been built through the Industrial Revolution. You know, they're the evolution from what the Industrial Revolution actually set. And that is why we have all these issues in the workplace today. Uh, they will start to get untangled if we reset it in the right direction, and we have this one shot of resetting it in the right direction. Okay. Good. Uh, maybe thanks. Uh, I think we've got 30 seconds. Does anybody want to take a crack at that? No, Skill sets? Well said. We're good. All right. Mike? 30 seconds on skill sets. I think it's very hard to generalize or get specific about one kind of skill set that employers will be looking for going forward. I think uh, when you look across work, it will require a broad variety of skill sets. Obviously, the uh, digital portion of it, though, will become more and more important no matter what job you hold. So certainly digital skills and the ability to work with digital systems I think is is one of the broad movements in work that will absolutely continue. Great. Actually, one point I would add is, um, you know, for us, uh, and Rob, you mentioned this earlier, um, the importance of soft skills, and that's really where it begins with us. So it's looking for, you talked about empathy, we're actually training, and, and that's something we look for in, in people, respect for the individual, integrity, a service orientation, obviously in a business like ours, that's really important. So for us, it begins with those values, and then there's a technical excellence component, depending on what job we're talking about, but, but it's both. Great. So thanks so spot on. In fact, including empathy, I would actually say trust as well, because you're taking a piece of your organization and handing them over to right. take it home and, uh, and deal with it, yeah. which essentially means trust and empathy both come together. Yeah. Great. Uh, Thank you so much, this uh, fantastic panel. Jan, Kathleen, Mike, Ravi, uh, Rita, thanks for hosting. Uh, thank you so much, really thanks appreciate it. Yes, thank, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're gonna bring this to an end. I wanted to first of all say, on behalf of Mark Cohan, uh, my team at Toronto Global, 
I wanted to thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a tremendous morning. We really appreciate it. I want to thank our team and partners at the uh, International Economic Forum of the Americas. I want to thank our political leaders who joined us, the premier, the mayors. I want to thank our speakers, our panelists, our hosts. I want to thank our sponsors, uh, Newfit Newfield, the, uh, the airport, um, Ports of Toronto, Globe and Mail, uh, Air Canada. Thank you so much. Uh, we are releasing our annual report tomorrow, so please check it out, Toronto Global. Uh, and I want to just mention that in spite of this uh, really crazy world we live in, we just had our best quarter ever in terms of results, so we're really excited. We're at a, we're at, at a really an inflection point here. Uh, it's a crazy time, the pandemic's been here, it's probably gonna be here for a while. But really, I I'm really optimistic, I'm excited about the future. You know, we're going to live with this for a while, but we will get through it. We will come back. We will come back stronger than ever. We all have a role to play in this. You saw the excitement today and the optimism from our panelists. I am truly excited. We will come back stronger than ever. Canada has a chance to lead the world out of this pandemic. And Toronto is going to be the leader, and we're going to be part of it, and we're all excited. So thank you again so much for joining us. And have a great day. Thank you. All right. Okay. Take it all in. Show up early. Stay late. Really late. Live your passion. Leave an impression. Commit. Get out. Get in. Embrace the moment. Hold. 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 Ah. <laughs> Overdo it. Do more. Leave less. Breathe. Get the bag. Keep one packed. Don't put it off. Because when we make it count, we rise higher. So it's hard to pick just one thing that I love about Toronto. I love how diverse the city is. Obviously, the first thing we have to talk about is our food. We have such an incredible diversity of restaurants. You can pretty much get anything here, and it will be done right. It'll be authentic. From lots of great Asian food to Mexican food, Cuban food, French food. Taste the entire globe in a day. Every neighborhood has its own flavor. Multiple Chinatowns. You head to the Danforth, our Greek district. You head up, Midtown. Little Jamaica. Jamaica is still thriving. And then you head back downtown. Pedestrian Sunday and Kensington Market. Kensington Market is just a collection of so many different cultures and stories over time. A lot of my favorite restaurants and vendors are still serving, doing their thing, just begging to be discovered or rediscovered. And there is so much to discover in the city. I love to do it by bike. That is the one thing that saved me this year. There are tons of trails around the Dawn River, Dawn Valley, Evergreen Brickworks, Woodvine Beach, Boardwalk. There are so many different well-known and hidden green spaces in the city where you can escape and forget that just a couple blocks away, you're right back in the action. So everybody knows about visiting the Toronto Islands in the summer months, but most people don't realize that you can also visit in the winter. I'd say pack some snowshoes or cross-country skis if you've got them. You can't beat those amazing skyline views from the Toronto Islands. One thing I have not tried that I want to is stand up paddleboarding out of the Scarborough Bluffs. So I'm gonna go on the board and take in the bluffs from a different perspective. I feel like I must be the last person in the entire city to try the edge walk. Way at the top of the CN Tower, I need to get up there, take the entire city in. I, w I would never, I would never do the edge walk. You could not pay me. <laughs> what do I miss most? People, gatherings. The city has such an amazing, frenetic and buzzy energy to it. It's lively, it's vibrant, it's people running into each other that they haven't seen in a long time. Or being out and randomly 
making new friends. Did, you, did someone just say hi? Yep. <laughs> so when the city fully reopens, the first thing I'm doing is taking my son to the aquarium and the Toronto Zoo. I am dying to go to a concert. You know, we just have such world-class talent here, and we also have world-class performers coming to visit us. Events and exhibits, whether it's uh, a festival, it's an art exhibit, it's a light installation. The Toronto Christmas Market, Pride, Carabana, the CNE. This city does festivals like no other, so I can't wait until they return in their full glory. Something that I discovered about Toronto over this past year is that we're tough, much tougher than advertised. I've just been blown away by the creativity to make it work. They are putting their work and their love on a plate or on the rack or wherever they put it. Overnight, merchants have had to figure out how to sell their stuff online. Fine dining establishments are creating takeout menus and meal kits. You know, you look at the support local initiatives that have been going on. So many things that show that people weren't just concerned about themselves, but their neighbors. The support of small business and community is beautiful and I think that's a true testament to the people who call Toronto home. We have made it this far and I'm excited for what's to come.